Hello and welcome to another episode of Two Hogs Are Better Than One. I think the last episode we did was just like a week ago, right? This has been perfectly paced in terms of scheduling. Is that right, Tom? Yeah, it's the the distance between them is growing. I know that we were, we're like, yeah, we can do this once every couple weeks. And then it was like, yeah, we can do it once a month. And now it's at two months. So look for the tab toe number five, four months from now. Oh, it's exponential. Right. Yeah, I, it's a, I, it's a, it's a doubling. It's okay, a, it's logarithmic. I remember that actually from like square one math television about learning about exponents <laughs> and logarithms. I know you think that all of my math as a lawyer really stopped in elementary school, uh, and uh, since you're a coder and have all that mathematics, that you stand above me on that score. But we'll leave do it you at remember, that. Remember? Do you remember that PBS show? Square one. Like, yeah, that's what that's what you're talking about. Okay, it is what yeah, I'm talking about. That's what I was about. saying. Like Math Man and. Math uh, Man. Uh, what was it? The the one that was dragnet. You know what joke? You know what the best part of this intro is, Tom? We are not aging ourselves at all. <laughs> I mean, we are hip and with it. And I, yeah. I assume that our audience wants to listen to us because we're not young and hip. Okay. Like, there's plenty of young and hip guys out there talking about this stuff, and, oh, and we have a different perspective. We're counter branding as old fogies. <laughs> I like it. I like it. And with that. For those of you who this is your first episode of Two Hogs Are Better Than One, or THABTO, as we like to call it around here, another HIP acronym that my brother and I came up with. My name is Rick Hogue. I'm a corporate lawyer. I do contracts. I help businesses form and fund. But my brother has what might be considered by some a slightly more exciting career than mine, and he is a game developer. Tom, where do you work? I work at High Moon Studios, which is a subsidiary of Activision. Yes. Um, and I just finished working on the last Zombies map for Black Ops 4, uh, Tag Der Toten, which is out, so I can talk about it now. Oh, fantastic. Well, I'm going to actually... Well, I mean, I can say that I worked on it. That's really, that's where it ends. Well, you're going to give all the secrets up, right? Like, that's what it says <laughs> in your contract. You can do that on this podcast. On all this the particular secrets. podcast. Uh, the the community's already found them, so... Oh. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I have no doubt... Really... They're rampant. <laughs> Before we get into it, I actually have a question for you on that. And and with the disclaimer, Tom, I know that you work at Activision. We can't talk about Activision stuff. Is there anything else we need to avoid on that score? Yeah, yeah. Just a general disclaimer. I work for Activision. These are opi my opinions, not Activision's. And I can't really discuss anything about Activision or Activision properties. Right. And now that you've said that, I'm going to ask you an Activision question. Sure. Um, sure, you've sure. released this zombies map. This isn't really about Activision. So you can tell me if you can't answer this, but I think maybe you can. But as this introduction, you release a zombies map out into the wild. If you're not familiar with zombies in Call of Duty, anybody that's watching this or listening to it, these things are absolutely ripe. They, they have secrets everywhere. As a matter of fact, in order to progress through whatever the ending of one of these maps is, you have to do weird stuff like hit the piano keys seven times, run around in a circle and look at a cat in a very specific way. Uh, and they're built that way. They're built to kind of be crowdsourced solutions. Is that, am, I, am I accurate on that, Tom? Mostly, uh, that's accurate. Uh, I think that from a design perspective, we try to balance sort of like there being some sort of logic to it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that like you can suss it out. Also, the last two maps we worked on and um, uh, what was the name of? Sorry, I know that the the dev names. I'm trying to remember. Uh, Ancient Evil. Okay. Uh, was what uh, in the Chaos storyline was one that people really appreciated because it kind of guided you a little bit more. It was like, oh, this is the thing you need to do. Um, there was an Oracle character that was kind of giving you hints as to what the next step was. And even if it and had a hundred steps, there was some instruction. There was some level of like kind of getting it, okay. um, giving you a little direction as opposed to, uh, there's a, there was a common complaint about one of the other maps that basically one of the steps involved shooting a random rock floating in space. Uh, <laughs> and people were like, that's, that's just, that's not interesting. That's just difficult. That's uncool. Yeah, you need somebody scraping the code to be like, it's mentioning something over here. <laughs> so yeah, the, the the you know, there, I think there's, I think with the stuff for Black Ops Four, there was a push to try to be like, at least some level of internally consistent. Um, the way that I always thought about it from a design perspective, and I wasn't in charge of like these big sort of quest authoring, like designing these things, was that I wanted it to be sort of obscure from the front but very obvious once you do it. Does that make sense? So like once you do it, you're like, oh, I see what I was doing. I was, you know, getting the water over here or I was trying to turn this lead into gold or whatever it was. Like once you do it, you're like, oh, I see what I was doing. Oh, got it. Uh, because your mechanisms in the world are really as a first person shooter fighting off zombies, you have to be a little bit esoteric board gamey with what is actually the function that you are achieving with whatever random things you're doing. So yeah, I'd like, yeah, that my, for me, that was always kind of the hope or the, the goal was like, 
after you do it, when you retroactively, it makes complete sense. Oh, I got it. That's interesting, actually. I really like talking design on these kinds of things. The actual question I was going to ask was, when you release one of these things into the wild, are, are you guys, and you don't have to speak for everybody, you don't have to speak about anything internal if, if it steps on any toes, but are you guys ever surprised by how fast people can solve this stuff? Um, that's the, uh, yes, I guess I would say, um, you know, we don't need to get into the secrets. I don't want the secret sauce. I'm just, you, you have these kinds of things. You work on them for months and months and months. I know this wasn't specifically your stuff, although you were implementing some of the scripts on this thing, on these things, what you put it out there in the wild and then somebody comes back in six hours and says that we got to the ending and we now have the trailer for the next part or something like that. Does it ever, that surprise you how, how quickly this stuff happens? I think a little bit. I don't know. Like, I'm not privy to any internal documentation or anything sure. that might indicate, like, how long they want that number to be. Yeah. And certainly it's a balance between, you know, playability and obscurity and, and frustration. And when, yeah. you, when you when you crowdsource anything like this, like, it, it gets solved real fast. Yeah, I think that's what I've always been surprised by. That's really kind of the nature of the reason I asked the question was, you know, I was really interested at the very tippy top start of – args these alternate reality games and i remember very vividly there was one for halo 2 which i think is probably pretty famous at this point although again we age ourselves uh called i love bees and it had all these different components and it seemed like nobody could possibly ever solve it and again this was at the start of all this but people were doing binaries and looking at sound files and finding x-ray images and realizing that i think at that for that game you had to hold balloons in various spots across the country uh for the game to be happy uh, and I think it always surprises me how if you put that many kind of monkeys in a room, uh, a, a screenplay pops out and, and people can solve these things. So I'm always interested in kind of a little bit of the behind the scenes. I'm sorry, Activision. I don't think that ruined any trade secrets. But if you want, I can give you my address. You can notify my lawyers, which is me. Uh, so redacted. Uh, yeah, redacted. We'll just there'll just be a long beep throughout this entire section before we get into the podcast. I won't even cut it. It'll just be beeped out. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, no, I appreciate that. I appreciate just the tiny bit of insight that doesn't violate any NDAs or existing contractual provisions. Thank you. Um, the first thing we usually talk about on two hugs are better than one though, is what we are playing. And in this case, since it's been two months, we wanted to pick out some of the real highlights. As it turned out, you, Tom reminded me that one of the games that I want to talk about and that I did a postmortem on, on this channel, uh, which you can check out. And if I remember, I'll put a card up in this video. Uh, is a game that I said that I was really looking forward to and was going to potentially be one of my games of the year uh, at the end of the last episode, which we did at the end of July. So we're going to talk a little bit about that, again, because I have that video up, because I know for a fact you haven't finished it. We are going to have a short discussion on that rather than a long-form discussion. That game is Control. Remedy Games is Control. But before we get into that, there is a game that I know you've been playing that is a revival of a now at this point in the land of video games, pretty old series that hasn't had a formal sequel in a long time. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your experiences with Borderlands 3? Yeah, so I am, I'm deep, I'm deep into Borderlands 3. I actually, I have my uh, epics, epic up here. I wonder what my, does it tell, it tells me my playtime somewhere. Uh, <laughs> uh, that, right. It says 50 hours. Yeah, I think, um, actually, I think there's been complaints about the Epic Game Store clock. Not that there has, hasn't been complaints about any given feature in the Epic Game Store, uh, <laughs> but I think that there have been reports of potential issues with the clock there. So I'm not sure that's right. Uh, it is a long, a while. I'd say it's probably like 30 or 40 hours, and I've certainly kept it on while I've been doing stuff around the house and stuff, so that's also hey. probably my fault. Yeah, you never know that. Uh, <clears throat> have you beaten it with that number, like 30 or 40 hours, or no? I have not. Um, I game. have. Game, I am... I think I'm closing in. I'd say I'm in the final act. Okay. Um, but yeah, I've been playing it a lot. Um, talking about it a lot at work with different developers and people who are playing it. Like it's sort of the, the rage right now. Yeah. Um, it's fun to co-op and play together. It's funny, actually. I don't play Borderlands co-op. I tried it a couple times and I actually had a good experience in Borderlands. What Borderlands, <laughs> Borderlands one co-op where basically it was just me and a friend uh in a zone that we were too low level for and trying to like keep each other alive and that was really cool but for the most part my experience with borderlands co-op was like four dudes running in opposite directions one guy basically like triggering and finishing every encounter before you get there vo just kind of like constantly playing and like having no real structure to it and i did not like that 
Uh, I did not like that co-op experience, and so I haven't played. I haven't played Border. I played Borderlands Three co-op a little, like thirty minutes maybe. A friend of mine was on, and we just did it. And um, otherwise, it's been all solo. But I've been very happy with Borderlands Three. Uh, I played Borderlands. Sorry, you breathed. Do you need to say something? No, not at all. I was the only thing I was going to jump in on there. And yes, I do breathe from time to time. Although <laughs> many lawyers are called robots or automatons, we are in fact human beings. Uh, what I was going to say was, you know, and I'm just jumping in a little bit here is you say you like it. I've also been enjoying my time with it. I played a lot less than you. But one of the rubs, if, if you will, that has come out about this game is that it's essentially Borderlands again. Is that has that been your experience, and is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing, or are is it not getting enough credit for the new things that it's doing? I think that that's a fair criticism, but also what I would ex sort of expect in a sequel. Uh, I think maybe they played it a little too safe in terms of not not branching out, but I, I think they did a lot in terms of like what they did with how the character progression and the action skills works, and all the different weapon manufacturers having much more of a a flavor to them and a real mechanic to them. Uh, I, you know, I think, I think there's, there's obviously endless opportunity to just continue to uh, change things and add new things and, and things like that. But I, I think they wanted to stay true to a certain feeling or formula. And I think largely they did that. And I think that mostly they evolved their systems uh, instead of kind of completely remaking them. Yeah. I mean, you to can... some extent borderlands was, kind of one of the first games to really try out this first-person shooter role-playing game combo that you see built up in a specific direction with things like Destiny. Uh, but it's not Destiny. It, it's something else. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, obviously, like, one of the big differences, you know, is the it's it's a, it's a random loot generator um, as opposed to sort of Destiny's more restricted loot table where there's, like, these hundred guns that can have different mods and stuff put on them. This is just, like looking at it from they let you look at the gun and kind of the pieces that are on it it seems like basically there's different pieces that have different kind of effects and they kind of smash those together and then the manufacturer also plays a role in terms of like how does this weapon generally behave yeah and that's kind of how you get it but but there's still a lot of um i don't know ver variety there and you can and like one gun or another you know i've had a few that uh along the way that i liked and eventually had to give up because they just i outgrew them uh yeah. in terms of power and there's no real way to bring them up but i had one I, my favorite i think still so far is i had a, a so tdor is sort of the discount uh gun manufacturer there and that the whole their whole thing is that their guns are disposable you don't reload them you just throw them away uh but when you do something happens and so mine was every time I threw it, it turned into three grenades that homed in on enemies. So I could just toss these things and like all these homing missiles were flying around shooting guys. And that was just really fun. This is really cool. Uh, I had a, an actual another developer who said uh, and I, I that his interpretation was everything about the game, like the characters, the weapons is all designed to like sort of break the game in sort of fun and interesting ways. And I think that's true. I think part of the reason why it appeals to me a little bit more than destiny right now. Destiny, I love, um, but I Shadow haven't played in a, next week, but I haven't played in a while because, uh, the pursuit and the grind is pretty demanding. And I like to be sort of more all over the place. I don't like to dedicate myself to just a single game. Mm -hmm. And it feels like destiny kind of demands that, uh, at least if you want to see some of the cool stuff. Um, it, so, Oh, what I was saying is, um, you know, borderlands is willing to, go a little crazier and not worry so much if they've created something unbalanced. Uh, I was going to say exactly the same thing, actually. I, I, that, that You say you grow out of the things, and you do. So that's kind of how they fix it a little bit. But I think in any given instance, break the game is the right way to phrase it. They are okay with allowing you to be overpowered for at least a period of time in your game. I have right now, a, a, I don't know what their highest end is. Is it exotic, legendary, something along those lines, whatever golden is. And that I have a gun that is very strong, very accurate, and doesn't need to reload and doesn't take ammo. And that's at this level, until you kind of outgrow it a little bit, that is, that is very strong. Uh, and I like that. I think that was really, to me at least, what made games like Diablo 2 so fun is that you could find things that would just break things for a while. And that was always what made getting the next piece of loot so interesting. And in my opinion, 
when you have loot that always everywhere has to be balanced, it's somewhat less fun to go find that chest to get that drop because you know, yes, you might have a slightly higher percentage. This will be a better gun overall, but it's not going to be anything that bounces up and down and shoots flamethrowers against the walls and things like that. Right. Yeah. Like I, um, I think the biggest improvement for me, honestly, is just a core one. I think they made the shooting, the movement, all of it just feel better. I think the AI is a little bit smarter in terms of taking cover and how it approaches you and stuff. And that ultimately just makes the whole experience better. I, I played Borderlands 2 leading up to Borderlands 3 because I was like, oh, I'll get myself prepped. I never finished Borderlands 2. Still haven't. <laughs> uh, because I just burned out on Borderlands 2. Like, there doesn't seem like there's enough stuff changing i don't really like the shooting feels very you know it's it's closer to it's an rpg that uses guns as the i'm clicking on a guy and he's dying um but doesn't feel like it's actually testing some sort of accuracy stuff and and movement and cover and it just did it, it, this version feels like it, it nailed those pieces a lot better and that brings the whole thing up so would you say that it's that it's the it's the visceralness the responsiveness the enjoyability of the moment-to-moment -moment shooting and gameplay that has helped you cross that hump because 30 or 40 hours that you say that you're in the game, that's a long time to be invested in, in borderlands. Is it just the shooting is, is the story compelling? I will admit that I haven't gotten far enough to really find anything compelling. And I know another piece of uh, kind of criticism is that it's very Mimi, which I think in my opinion, borderlands has always been. So I don't really hold that against it, but are you finding that you have enough drive to go to the next place? I know new planets are kind of, uh, useful in getting new color palettes out there and things like that. But is it just the shooting or is it more? I don't think the storyline hugely drives me though. I do think they did a pretty good job of establishing a kind of a threat from the villains, um, which okay. honestly, I don't think borderlands has done very well in the past. Handsome Jack's pretty cool. Handsome Jack is cool in terms of he's this, you know, tool that's constantly talking to you and eventually term had, right there and eventually gets a little bit of teeth um that you know you you react to i think they managed to get those teeth earlier on the calypso twins who are the the bad guys uh, uh, yes yes influencers twitch influencers that are the bad guys in the borderlands 3 universe um and as far as i so it's funny actually we had a meeting at work where we talked about borderlands 3 as sort of a critical analysis because it's like something that we're trying to do is you know just review current games and talk sure. about them as a team at a critical level and um, I was, I said to me personally, I found the writing a little bit more I, palatable for me. I now maybe that's because I've played the beginning twenty hours of Borderlands two like four times, <laughs> and like on the fourth reading, it's not that great. I, you know, I don't know, but I just found it more palatable. Um, I found it, it. I think the whole style of the game is supposed to be kind of cringy. Like it's just that's it's supposed to make you be like, oh God, did they really do that? Yep, mission accomplished. I, I I don't disagree with you, but yeah, mission accomplished, definitely. Um, I, I but I found it, I don't know, just a lot a little less like hardcore crass, just like that you're just saying stuff that people shouldn't say and I don't want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> um I but I couldn't tell I couldn't tell you. Like I said, I played Borderlands 2's front end repeatedly, so maybe that's just once is okay, four times is too much. Um, yeah, I don't mind also, it that much either. I just, I was interested in your opinion on it because a lot of people do say, I think one of the, one of the criticisms that was framed in a way that I thought it was actually accurate to me. And I don't take it as a criticism was, I believe I saw someone say they took the claptrap character and kind of smeared him over every character in borderlands. And it does feel that way a little bit to me. I think that's fair. I, I think generally I'd say that that's, if I had a critique in terms of their, uh, I don't know, dialogue, I guess it would be that they, they seem to really only have one way that they can write things. There's not, yeah. there's no other dimensions. Like everyone's kind of smarmy, sarcastic tools. Uh, <laughs> and that's it. Like there's no, Oh, this person's really authentic. I mean, you get that a little bit from some of the characters or, or this person's really, you know, broken in a certain way or whatever. There's just like, no, nope, everyone here is kind of an asshole. Uh, right, which that's I think like makes it the a basic little bit thing. I think that makes it a little bit hard for some folks, especially to engage with, right? You can't, it doesn't take itself seriously. So you can't take it seriously, which means you're ultimately playing a game, which I think can work for, if that's what you're looking for, I think it works for you and I, I think when people actually want to be immersed in it a little bit, it kind of actively pushes you away from doing that. 
I think that's fair. I totally agree with that. And I, I think that, like I said, they, they do a, an okay job establishing the threat with the villain, but there's never that drive to be like, I've got to save the universe right, or whatever, which you kind of get in some games. Um, I'd say you even like the, the closest comparison for Borderlands three is probably Diablo three or Diablo series. And I don't think those stories are particularly strong either, but oh, I no. think they're significantly stronger than Borderlands three. Yeah, they're not. No, but I mean, you think about something like destiny and by God, Tom, I am ready to take down those triangles. I don't know what they mean. <laughs> I don't know why they're out there, but I'm ready. Uh, my circles are going to kick the heck out of those triangles. <laughs> Speaking of yep. which, shadow keep next week. Yep. Uh, yep. <laughs> yeah, I gotta get my uh, I gotta get my stuff all transferred over to Steam. You do actually. You have to do it in the next two days. I think I was just hitting all those buttons. Oh, um, do I shoot? I better get. Yeah, on I don't. There. I don't think it like explodes on you or anything, but it com- it becomes completely unplayable. I think on the first. Um, yeah, I think there's. I think there's like some grace period for getting your stuff. But yeah, yeah. I don't know. Do it. Yeah, hit that button, definitely. Well, so yeah, Borderlands 3, obviously, if it's entertained you for 30 hours, it has entertained me. I will I will let you know that I kind of fell off it a little bit, um, if only because I wanted to play something that I was engaging with a little bit more. But I did like every bit of it, and I agree completely with you that um, it feels a lot better. I mean, we're not quite up to Bungie. Nobody is, in all honesty. But it does, moment to moment, feel a lot more engaging to actually play, and that does help make you not want to stop playing for long periods of time. And I think the loot is great. Now, obviously they say 28 trillion guns or whatever, you know, mathematics is fun when you multiply things by each other. Uh, but um, I, I sure. have been enjoying it and I look forward to trying some of the more uh, different skill tree builds uh, if I ever get to that point in time. Uh, but if you've played it for 30 hours, then I'm looking forward to playing it for more than maybe the dozen that I've played it at this point. Is there anything else you want to say on Borderlands 3? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, you know, similar to you kind of like, I, I'm at whatever I'm at. Um, and I have sort of downplayed it a little bit. Like I was, it was all I was playing. Um, <laughs> and it, and it had worked fine because the way that my gaming had come out, I hadn't had a lot of like long sessions. So it works really well for like, Oh, I'm playing on a lunch hour or I've got a, an hour tonight or whatever. Um, but it's also like for what it's worth from a, a personal perspective, very easy to step away from. So okay, yeah. when the wife's like, Hey, do you want to watch a show? I'm like, yep. Uh, now the warning it, there has to be you can't pause that game, right? That's like a online game. Uh, no, Borderlands single player can be paused. Borderlands pauses. Okay, couldn't quite remember. I'm glad we got to get that kind of information out there. This is important for people <laughs> that have to drop it immediately. Nope, Borderlands pauses, and actually, um, I don't think they have enough fast travel points in my opinion. Like a lot of the zones are still really long, which is the same problem I had with Borderlands Two. Yeah, but. They do have mid uh, mid zone saves. So if you leave and come back and you were near a new you, it brings you to whatever the most recent new you you were at was. So you can shut down and come back and have no problem. Yeah, I remember I, I, I just turned it off flat and it, it brought me back to a place where I was I didn't lose anything, I don't think. So Yeah, and I don't I don't think I, I at least remember a couple of times in Borderlands 2 where that was not the case, where it was like, I gotta finish this zone and this zone's gonna take like an hour and a half. And if I don't, I'm going to have to do it again. Well, I'm glad you're liking it so much. I certainly like playing a game that is colorful. I think yeah, to, to totally. some extent we're, we're going away from that again, uh, like the 360 era. And certainly when we talk about the very end stuff, what we're looking forward to, I have a complaint about one of the things that I am actually looking forward to in terms of kind of desaturating all of its color. Um, but if that's it on Borderlands 3, I did want to talk a little bit about the game that I was looking forward to so much at the end of – uh, two months ago at the end of July, and that is Remedy Games' Control. Now, before uh, you start talking, I want to actually tee this up a little bit because I just I happened to just <laughs> listen to our podcast Yeah, um, from two months ago. I, I, I run, I listen to Rick's stuff, and our stuff is kind of jammed in there, so occasionally I hear it. And it was not just Rick was excited for this. It was like <laughs> a discussion of it. We were talking about sort of spoilers and, and not reading stuff in advance, and Rick's like, yeah, I'm not reading anything about Control because it's a Remedy game. I know it's going to be awesome. They seem like they're at the top of their craft and go Rick. <laughs> that is a good tee up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for those of you that are interested in two hugs are better than one and didn't listen to my postmortem. Uh, I don't get a chance to do postmortems on video games very often because those are for beating things. Those are for finishing a movie or, or beating a video game. And I did do a postmortem on control cause I did beat it and it was very disappointing to me. Now, I have to put this in context in a couple of ways. One is 
uh, Tom and I have talked about this at length, and we'll probably talk about it as part of this conversation, but you can't be disappointed in something unless you're expecting something out of it. And as Tom pointed out right there, I think probably to humiliate me or make me feel worse about my opinions on this video game, always hard to tell with brotherly love, uh, but I was really looking forward to this. Remedy is one of my favorite developers. Alan Wake, which was the game that they made about a writer who has to deal with the horrors of his own creations and whether or not he's created by another writer and all sorts of good meta contextual stuff, is one of my top five games of all time. And this was Remedy taking what they had learned in between Alan Wake and Quantum Break and now putting it all into uh, the purpose of, of making a kind of paranormal supernatural game again. Uh, in which you play as a character, Jesse Faden, you go through what amounts to a government building that just so happens to be the official location of the X-Files, for lack of a better phrase, <laughs> where they're, they're looking at all sorts of paranormal things and having to deal with that in a more open world environment than Remedy has done. Now, I say I was disappointed in it. I was disappointed in it primarily for narrative reasons. Uh, if you know me, if you followed the stuff that I do on this channel or in Thabto, you know that story is very important to me. I need to be driven through uh, why I'm playing this game, why I'm engaging with it moment to moment, and the story and control, which we're not going to spoil here, especially because Tom's going to talk about it in a second, and he's not that far in it. He's about halfway through the game. Uh, it just didn't work Wait, for I'm me. about halfway through? I don't know. We're going to talk about where you're at. <laughs> Let me finish my intro. And... <laughs> I, I, it didn't work for me. Now, the action is great. The graphics are very good. But the story didn't work for me. The narrative wasn't there. And because I had it in my head as this is going to be as good as Alan Wake, this is going to be one of my games of the year, you get to that end point and you're just so deflated that it just didn't work for you. Now, part and parcel to this story, if you're not online, if you're not on social media, is this. Everybody freaking loves control. OK, so if you're listening to me on this, I am completely out on my own. I am I am not even in the ballpark of where most people are talking about control right now. Now, I find that fascinating, but Tom will be fully willing to divulge. This is not the only time I've ever been out on my own and far afield from general consensus. But everybody loves this game. And I think primarily it's because the moment to moment gameplay does feel good. It does feel good to throw rocks off the wall at bad guys. It does feel good to dash around. And uh, I think people either like a kind of weird, non-moving character arc narrative more than I do, or they don't care about it. You know, a lot of game players don't care about that. They care about gameplay. They weight that more than I do. And so they like control a little bit more. But if you're interested in more of my thoughts, especially spoiler thoughts on the narrative, there's a post-mortem video. It's about 40 minutes. It's on this channel. I highly recommend checking it out, especially if you've already beaten the game or if you don't care to beat the game. Otherwise, you'll want to wait on that. But Tom... Because you're halfway through, you just heard what I had to say about it. I don't know if you've listened to my postmortem at all, uh, because it does have those spoilers. You know, how were you feeling about your experience with Control right this second? I haven't listened to the postmortem for the reason that I do intend to play it. It seemed like something that I would like. I let's see, based on uh, you know, I I don't have, I don't have a lot of, I don't know, I don't have a lot of expectations for what the narrative will do. I like the tone. I think the tone is fun. This sort of weird, uh, I don't know, science fiction, paranormal. These objects do crazy stuff um, and it affects the world in weird ways. And, you know, what does that mean? Here's a toaster that, uh, you know, makes people yeah, think weird minds. thoughts yeah. or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think that's cool. And I, I like the I, I like the juxtaposition of that, this sort of paranormal crazy with government bureaucracy. I think that's a very funny tone of like, how would the, you know, social security administration deal with a light bulb that summons demons? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I, and I think just that, that writing I, I found very interesting. Um, I so far have not found much interesting in the characters. Um, you know, I think um, the, the exposition character is fine. She does a, you know, it's nice to talk to her and, and get the background. Uh, the main character doesn't appear to have a lot of depth so far. Ultimately, if that never happened, if this is just uh, effectively Metroid 1, I'm okay with that. Um, okay. I think the setting is cool. I think the gameplay is solid. I think the progression system so far feels a little bland. 
uh, in terms of I get these mods and they basically are like, it's 10% to this or 20% to this, or they're not really affecting my gameplay dramatically. And that's kind of a complaint I have in anything that has equipment or mods or, or anything like that is if, if you're not doing anything that's sort of significant, if you're just changing percentages, uh, there's not a lot to feel there. <laughs> right. Right. But well, I, I, and I didn't even get into my video on inventory management. It does have that kind of, oh, you've got 25 mods, none of which you care about. Let's at least delete all the ones that are lesser than the ones you already have and uh, figure it out from there. There's a lot of that, and I agree with you. And when it's 12% or 15%, it's hard to feel and it's hard to care about. Yeah, yeah. It's like I right now I don't have a real build, um, and that's, you know, yeah, that's – that the the sort of the next thing we're going to talk about, I think, is a much more interesting sort of <laughs> build design game, which is How why about that segue, huh? Which is why <laughs> I engaged with it so hard. But I actually was playing Control right before this, uh, just because I was actually playing Bloodstained. I recently signed up for Game Pass, and that's a Metroidvania, and Control is kind of a Metroidvania, and so I was like, oh, that's like a that you know that's a modern take on metrovania that i wanted to check out so i started playing that and i was like yeah it feels solid like i like ripping things off the walls and throwing them at stuff and shooting them with my excalibur gun <laughs> yes, bloodstain's a much more literal uh, interpretation of a modern metrovania than control is although it oh yeah has those elements bloodstain is like i'm playing symphony of the night i think some of the music might be the same i think it has this it might have the same composer you'd have it, to look I, at the i think that's i think that's probably right or something like that or they were just like Make it sound like Symphony of the Night, but don't listen to that music because you can't copy it. <laughs> uh, that's called a temp track, and then you just have people be like, it, it needs to sound like this-ish. Sounds like uh, this-ish. Yep. Yeah. Have, have you ever listened to all the fake like Terminator 2 Judgment Day like drum intros? They're all they're all hilarious. You can get like oh, six, no. six on YouTube. No. Uh, with, like the free audio. It's like, oh, yeah, I know what that's supposed to be. Uh, uh, but, yeah, I, I, you know, that's the light conversation about Control. Um, I wanted to love it. I don't love it, and so that makes me disappointed in it. But certainly, if you're at all interested in it, don't stop here. I think my brother's enjoying it more than I did. Everybody else has enjoyed it a lot. Uh, so absolutely check it out if you're remotely interested in it. I certainly don't want anything bad to happen to Remedy because they have made some of my favorite things ever. Uh, and when you beat it, you know, come back to my postmortem and then complain in my comments uh, to that video about how dumb I am and how I should have loved it more, like others have done. Uh, I love you all. You got it. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, you actually had an excellent segue there uh, because I did want to kind of start talking a little bit. Borderlands 3 Control, kind of huge games, big marketing pushes, both Epic Games exclusives because, you know, Tom has chosen his battle here. I'm just joking. Uh, but um, I I'm not playing Control on the Xbox. So. <laughs> I wanted to talk about a few things that were a little bit more under the radar, although this next thing maybe started under the radar, but it didn't finish there. Tom... You have been telling me for maybe a month or more now how awesome Remnant something about Ashes is. <laughs> Why don't you tell me about that game? Remnant from the Ashes. Thank you. Yeah, I. Um, it's funny. I had this game on my wish list when I first saw it. I was like, oh, that looks really cool. And then I just completely forgot about it. Uh, and then it was like coming out and I was looking at it. And I had just recently bought Planetfall and I was like, I don't really have money for this. So I kind of set it aside and was playing a lot of Planetfall, which is great. And we can talk about it at some point. Um, and eventually, like, I watched, I was looking at Remnant more. I was on my own for the weekend. And I was just like, I actually asked my wife, hey, uh, can I spend $40 on a game that I don't need? She's like, yeah, totally. Yeah, so I bought always it. Always dangerous. Always and dangerous. That, and that weekend, I just, like, I played it nonstop for, like, two days. Yes, I got, like, three calls from you that were like, this Remnant game, Rick. I was like, uh, what? What are you talking about? No, What was... is this game even, Tom? What, what, is t what type of game is this? So it's a Souls-like, ostensibly, okay. in terms of that it's very it's technical combat, um, a lot of dodge rolling. It is specifically ranged combat focused, so using guns and crossbows and, and things like that. There is melee uh, fighting, but it's, it's mostly just uh, trying to conserve ammo or uh, get uh, some other effect from the melee weapon. It's not really okay. the the for the focus so it's it's sort of a souls like it actually is um somewhat procedurally generated so the world is is kind of regenerated or generated each time you kind of start a run and they actually recently introduced uh, a new thing called adventure mode which is instead of re-rolling the whole world and having to kind of run the game again you can re-roll individual like zones so that you can kind of see 
uh, different content. So that's the, the key is like in one single run, you don't see everything. Because and it, I think it's important here. It, it's a, it's at least a procedurally generated component smasher, right? I mean, it's like, it's taking bits and pieces out of the Lego box and putting them together. Yeah. So uh, for instance, the, the main boss at the end of the first zone, there's two possibilities. I've only actually seen one and I've run it twice. Uh, and the fun conversation was people, you know, this was something that we talked about a lot at work and, and with my friends there. And it was like, did you get this thing? And it's like, no, what, what are you talking about? Or like, do you have this piece of equipment or whatever? And it's like, no, how do you get that thing? And a lot of that kind of like, and, and sort of, I don't know, almost crazy making where people are like, oh, you didn't get the, for instance, I missed the sniper rifle. Let's just like, it's okay. you get it pretty early. Um, I'm fairly certain it's in every run. And I was like, no, I didn't get that. It must not have been in my run. And people are like, yeah, you know, you just missed it. Um, <laughs> and so you get this, like, is it not in my world or did I just not find it? <laughs> uh, and that's interesting. And it also has, it has kind of interesting, um, sort of tone and setting, which I actually liked. Uh, I don't think that the overarching plot is like huge. And I personally didn't, I thought the ending was kind of lackluster. I thought they could have done more there. Um, but overall love the experience. I've just loved it. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's great. It's, and, and what I was saying with, re with relation to control is I think it, it still has like percentage, uh, mods and equipment and stuff like that. But the way that it all lines up, the way that you can kind of build things, you can really customize builds and create things that are very specifically sort of like oriented to do something. So my favorite build for what, for what it's worth is, or, or the, at least the way that my equipment ended up, uh, is basically this kind of like one shot build. So all of these things, um, there's a few weapons. So the, the main component of that is I have, I think it's, is it gear? I think it's the gear that I have makes it so that after I reload, the next shot that I take does extra damage. So I combine that with weapons that basically reload every shot and Oh, nice. And other things like that. And now suddenly I'm like basically one shotting things um, as long as I hit them in the head. Yeah. I mean, to give people that are listening or watching this a bit of background, you're obviously a game designer by trade, but you also love board games. You love rule sets that are kind of systemic and that you can build things out of that can help break the game. So that sounds like exactly like the kind of thing that you would like to do is kind of figure out how there's some synergy between these two kind of almost magic cards and put them together and make something that's even more powerful than either of them uh, operating independently. Yeah. And I mean, it's got a pretty decent economy in terms of like, if you wanted to level everything up to full, like that's going to take you a lot. So you can kind of focus and then, you know, spread a little bit and see like, Oh, what it would be like if I started using this as my primary weapon? Like what are ways to kind of riff on that? And that's been really fun. Yeah. Build design. Um, in terms of like character build design is something I love. I'm super into. And so any game that's got like a decent amount of stuff to do there, I really enjoy. Yeah. Um, Remnants is another one that actually I think was particularly um, noted by people for the co-op. It's basically a, a Dark Souls type game with co-op. Um, I have not played that at all. Uh, <laughs> that's I my played... fault, everybody. <laughs> no, I played it a little bit with one friend. Oh, you mean because we have it on like different systems? Well, and you, no, I don't think I actually own it yet. I don't oh, you think. don't own it? <laughs> but, uh, For some reason asked... I thought, oh, no, I remember. You were like, this looks like something that's going to end up on Game Pass. I did I say will that. wait. <laughs> I did say that. Well, that was before it spent a month at number one on Steam or whatever. But it did look like one of those games where it's, I got Borderlands 3. I got one of the games I'm going to talk about next. Uh, and Remnant looks great, Tom. Yeah, it looks, you know, I'm sure it's awesome, buddy. Uh, I'll get it sometime. Uh, and so I think that's a little bit of my fault. In, in truth... Uh, since you're glowing about it, since others are glowing about it, since it has sold apparently very, very well, I probably should have given it a try when it was uh, initially out. But now we've crossed the Rubicon. Now it's like, no, I, I, I can't. That was a free month. Now I got to wait for it to. I gotta now I got to wait for a drop. Got to wait for some, a drop. some kind of drop. Yeah, no, I can't. <laughs> I gave up that time. I can't do it now. Uh, that's weird. We could talk about my psychology some other, some no, other time. Yeah, I hear you. But it sounds it sounds like a lot of fun. I, I think you said you love the setting. It's a post-apocalyptic or some kind of apocalypse, I think. Yeah, uh, it's effectively post-apocalyptic. Okay. Um, basically, the world has been destroyed by uh, these creatures called the Root. Um, nice. And actually, um, the whole story kind of goes around sort of 
what the root are and, and what that means. And it's actually uh, about like different dimensions or different worlds that are all kind of tied together. And I won't go any further than that, but it's, I actually really like the lore. Um, I don't, I think they do a good job of not like tremendously overdoing it, but if you look okay. at, and I mean, it's, it's similar to, uh, you know, Dark Souls in this regard, but in my opinion, a hundred percent more palatable um, that you can look at descriptions of items and journals that you find in the world, you know, descriptions of other things and kind of put together, okay, I see what this world's about and how this ties into everything and, 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 and who that guy just fought is and, and why he is the way he is and things, things like that. Like you really can get a lot of that, but it's not kind of shoved down your throat. It can just be like a, no, I'm just going through a thing, killing guys. And that's yeah, I'd heard that. I'd heard that the lore is, is if anything, better than the plot and that the, the world is pretty fun. I think that's right. I think the plot, you could break down to like three or four sentences. Uh, but the <laughs> lore, the actual like exploring and understanding the things is like, oh, that's cool. Like, I like what they did there. Yeah. Well, so Remnant, what, Rise from the Ashes? Uh, no, just just from the Ashes. Just from the Ashes, which I think you is don't why rise. it's kind of a little hard to, to recall because it's like, that's like a weird subtitle. Yeah, because you assume it's Rise, but they're like, no, we're not giving you that. We're not saying what's happening with you in the ashes. It's just from it. Yep, just ashes <laughs> exist, and this is from there. Well, cool. Yeah, well, while you were playing Remnant, which was – and we, we, we're talking about them as hidden gems because I think that one's from a company – is it Gunfire? Did I get that right? Yep, that's Gunfire. Uh, they made Darksiders 3. Okay, yeah. Um, yep, I yep. Don't – I – believe that they are making dark siders four. I don't know if that's been confirmed, but that's everyone's suspicion that, and I believe they actually confirmed this. I'm not positive that remnant was effectively born from trying to figure out what they were doing in, in dark, in dark siders four. Right. For the fourth, uh, horseman, which uses, which uses guns. I think that's, um, uh, F wrath maybe. I don't know. Uh, I'd have to, I'd have to go through their lore because their four horsemen are not the, uh, the biblical, yeah, uh, four horsemen. Well, it's hard so. to make uh, pestilence and famine really fun to play. Uh, you can you know, war and war and death. People. Yeah. War and death. The ones that they started with, they're like, yeah, we got, we got that one. We can figure that yeah. one out. Nailed it. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so that's a that's a kind of um, a hidden gem type company, just kind of coming into its own. I think they've made. I, I really like Dark Siders Three a lot more than some other people did. You've now spoken up, Remnant. The, one of the games I want to mention uh, before I mention a different game that is also a hidden gem is that while you were playing Remnant and at the, really the same time that Borderlands 3 came out, I was playing a game from a company called Spiders, uh, which is an RPG oh, company right. that has made in its past essentially ultra ambitious, like fully funded Bioware style AAA RPGs without any of the funding or polish. Uh, <laughs> and so... I respect that. I really do. You know, the PlayStation 2 era, the Super Nintendo era, these various eras had these companies that were really reaching above their means. And I think we've gotten away from that a little bit because it costs so much money that you have to bet the company every time you want to do that. I've really enjoyed watching Spiders go from making an RPG and being like, well, you know, that isn't that isn't so bad. I, it's, a, it's amazing that with that amount of money and those amount of people that you can make something like that to a game that they released this past month called Greedfall which is an RPG that, in my opinion, out of this style of RPG, which we're going to call Bioware RPG for the sake of discussing it. I don't actually think Bioware makes these kinds of games anymore, but for, for purposes of this discussion, is a Bioware RPG that is really, really close to the level of polish and the enjoyability of a Bioware game, uh, of, of the old type, not Anthem, but you know your, your Dragon Age Origins or your Mass Effects and those kinds of things. And in Greedfall... You take the role of a diplomat who is sent from the old world. Uh, it's all fantasy world, but in terms of the kind of uh, metaphor here, the old world, like a European type old world that has to go over to the new world to hopefully find a cure for a plague that is infected the old world. And you have to deal with these various other old world nations that all have colonies on this island. And you have to deal with a native population that isn't thrilled about being exterminated by the various countries. And also you have to deal with the fact that there's a bunch of magic and giant animal beasts and monsters and things like that. And what I really, really love about this game is that most of the storytelling, most of the world building all takes place in dialogue. So you go back to that old school Bioware approach of talking things out. You really are a diplomat. You have some attack. 
and you have some battling. But for the most part, you're in a side quest. You're going to go to seven different people. You're going to decide on whether to jail or execute someone. You're going to have these conversations. You're going to have to pay attention to what's happening. And at the same time that you're having a quest like that, you're also getting the world built for you. You're understanding what these various factions are doing. You're understanding what your companions want of you and whether or not they like you. You're having those companion quests. You're having those conversations that help you understand both the world, who you are, who your people are. And that's what I have always really loved about RPGs, especially of the Bioware ilk. And it has made me sad that so many companies have gone away from that. Now, I will tell you, Greedfall is made by spiders. They don't have a AAA budget. They're not, you know, funded by Sony or Microsoft or someone like that. Although if Microsoft decides to buy another six companies, it wouldn't surprise me necessarily if they went this direction. But so because of that, it doesn't have that a thousand percent polish. It has a slightly wonky camera. You run a little bit weird. If you try to run diagonally, you will walk that kind of thing, but you get used to it. You work around it. And because of the quality of the writing, it's not quite Witcher level, but it's getting in that neighborhood. You wind up enjoying yourself if you like those stories told to you, if you like those narratives told to you. Tom, that's my opinion on Greedfall in short form. Have you actually played this at all or not at all? Uh, yes. No, I did. I turned it on. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't feeling it. And that's <laughs> yeah, not, you, you have to be in the right mood. You have to be in right. the right mood. This, uh, it's not a commentary on the game. It was. I mean, more like, yeah, my place of like, nope, this isn't what I want to do. Yeah, well, um, if you're playing 40 hours of Borderlands and you're shooting alien dogs in their face, and then it's, hey, I'm, uh, I'm going to wear this feather in my hat and I'm going to talk to this diplomat lady, you, it's going to, yeah, you got to let the gears spin a little bit. But, um, yeah, I, so I don't, I don't really have an assessment on it. Obviously, I think sure. in the short form, the bugs end up being more of a pain or the, the kind of lack of polish rather than bugs. Uh, then, you know, the positives. So I think that's also like, I think you have to get past that a little bit. Most notably, I, I was like, your character takes a second to stop. And <laughs> they do, they do. This is a game where you're trying to talk to people and I would always end up basically behind them. Um, yeah, and yeah. that was really friggin' annoying. Yep. Yeah, no, it's got that kind of, exactly what my brother just described. It's got those kinds of little quality of life issues. And as he also described, yeah, if you've played it for 15, 20 hours, you get used to when you have to lay up on the button and things like that. You get used to not running diagonally and knowing that you have to either swing the camera around or, or, or use it to your advantage. Uh, but yeah, I think in the short term, as you say, getting used to those, it's going to feel a lot a, a, like a lot higher percentage of the experience than it ultimately winds up being. Yeah, it's just like, especially in the opening area. And these weren't even important things. This is like a NPC walking by. who's just going to be like, hi, dude. Um, <laughs> I try to talk to him and he's moving. And like, I couldn't, I was like, I can't get, and why do I have to be so close to you? <laughs> this is the game designer in you talking. I like it actually. This is good. Uh, and I think some people took some points off it for that purpose and things of that nature. Uh, but I will say this is by far spiders, most ambitious game. And it's, it, it regardless of what Tom and I say about little quality of life things, it's within spitting distance of exactly what you want out of that kind of game. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about because uh, Greedfall really is as significant for me and I've enjoyed it as much as I have due to its narrative, due to its storytelling, is my brother's absolutely favorite genre of game, the visual novel. <laughs> um, and uh, I say that yep. out of... Yep. I don't think Tom's... Have you ever played a visual novel? I try to get you to play 999 all the time, but have you played any of these? I bought I bought the Zero or uh Zero Escape. Mm -hmm. Zero Escape stuff um with the intention of playing it. Hopefully I'll get into it at some point. I thought this is a good reason great. to buy I can, something. I can play it on my well, it was on sale. I can play it on my laptop. Uh but then the sort of use pattern for my laptop is that I'm in bed and my wife's watching something on TV and I was like this is not for that. No, you can't have two narratives going at once usually. My, my brain can't. There, I think there are some people that can, uh, but I, yeah, I was just like, I can't. Two lines of dialogue are coming into my brain. I think my brain is melting. Yeah, I mean, visual novels are, if you've got a spectrum of story versus gameplay, you know, you've got your, uh, your only man shoot at the far end, probably, or, or like Quake Arena or something that doesn't have a story at all. And then you go all the way down to adventure games, which actually have some gameplay elements in them, and then you have visual novels. Now, uh, the game I'm about to talk to you about, AI, The Somnium Files, is actually the uh, kind of uh, subsequent 
title that the director of the Zero Escape series has put out there. And if you're not familiar with Zero Escape, this is a game series I've tried to get my brother to play at length. Uh, <laughs> it has the games 999, Virtue's Last Reward, and Zero Time Dilemma. That's the trilogy of Zero Escape games. And if you are at all interested in puzzles and interesting characters and uh, not exactly time travel, but dealing with time elements uh, and, and having to figure out interdimensionality and things like that, I highly recommend this series. You can get it at, for cheap uh, at the right time on various sales for PC or PlayStation 4. I think the games are now presented in a package called the Nonary Games, I believe. Uh, but uh, you can get the... Yep. It's actually, so having just recently purchased this, is actually two parts. Virtue's Last oh, okay. Reward, I think, is in its own. All right. Um, and the Nonary Games is uh, the first two. Uh, Virtue's Last Reward is the second one. Oh, well, then the third one is on its own. <laughs> yeah, Zero Time Dilemma? Okay. Well, in any event, yes, you, can that's get, right. you can Zero Time you Dilemma. Can, you can get these games in various packages. I highly recommend them. Yes, you can't play them on a laptop in bed with your wife. I apologize for that. But if you've got the capacity to play them, uh, and focus on the narrative. They are some of the best video game stories that I have played from a kind of pulpy perspective. They're not necessarily going to have high emotionality or, or really help you understand your humanity in a functional way. But if you're interested in an adventure story and having that kind of pulpy perspective, it is it is great. Uh, and AI The Somnium Files, which might be the worst title of any video game we're going to talk to you about in Two Hugs Are Better Than One, if only for remembering it is the follow-up to this series of games. And in this game, you play a detective in a fictional version of Japan and in Tokyo uh, that's dealing with a murder, but also happens to have an artificial intelligence in your eyeball that talks to you as a projection of a Japanese teenage girl. Uh, and as part of this game, you have to deal with notions of artificial intelligence, computerization, automation, dealing with what various people think about all those things, and as part of the puzzle process, in these games, they're not just pure visual novels where you just kind of pick a thing to say and you go on to the next chapter. In the Nonary games, the Zero Escape series, and in this game, you have these puzzle interludes. And in this particular case, you've got a machine that allows you to connect to various people that are unwilling to talk to you as part of your investigation, unwilling or unable. And you can go into their dreams. And as part of that, you're only allowed to be in those dreams for about six minutes, I believe. And you can do various things, but they all follow dream logic. So you have to figure out within that time period whether or not you should pull the lamp cord to open up the window shades over there because light and light and things like that in order to navigate mental locks that these people have on whatever it is they're trying not to tell you or they don't want to tell you. And as, as part of all that, they've got a very long form story. You've got all the, the good things about a visual novel in terms of characterization and, and going through and learning about all these people. You've got files that kind of detail everything that you've learned. And you've got these puzzles. You've got these setups that allow you to figure out how to navigate these dreams. And in, as part of those puzzles, you also have multiple solutions, which can essentially bifurcate the timeline and give you different interactions with the world that you have to navigate and figure out the various pieces of all the information in order to understand the story that's being presented to you. So if you like 999 or the Zero Escape series, this, although I don't think it's advertised this way, AI, the Somnium Files, is what you're looking for. This is from that director. This is from that company. This is that follow-up to that game. It is going to be, I'm going to just be to totally honest, it is going to be very difficult to kind of get used to if you're not familiar with this game type. Or if you've got an issue with, uh, let's call it uh, interesting cultural Japanese humor. They have a tendency to uh, have laughs and jokes about things that maybe uh, U.S. citizens and Americans that are a little bit more sensitive to certain issues uh, regarding uh, identity or sexualization and things of that nature might not be as comfortable with. Now, it's not making any big political points. It's not trying to do anything like that. It's just kind of goofy about some of those things, much like you might see in an anime series that's dealing with fan service or something along those lines. So you have to be okay with that. You have to be uh, cognizant that it's going to do that. It's not part of the plot line, but it is something that you are going to have to be aware of. Other than that, I give it my most high recommendations. It is a compelling game. It is interesting uh, from start to, I almost said finish, but from start to wherever the middle is where I'm at uh, after having played it for 10 or more hours. Uh, but I highly recommend it. I have it on the Switch. It works great on the Switch. 
And Tom, I know you're not going to buy this game uh, and you're not going to try it unless I force it on you when I next visit you. Uh, but does any of that, what I've described, sound interesting? I'm sure you're interested in an artificial intelligence eyeball. Yeah, I mean, it sounds interesting. Um, yeah, I haven't found like visual novels to be particularly um, compelling for me. Though I have, I've had some of the sort of, I don't know, more narratively driven games uh fill a nice you know space in terms of if i'm really not feeling like i want to do something that's a little more interactive than a show but like not a lot more <laughs> <laughs> yeah i uh, passive but not too passive but also not too active hit me visual novel yeah, you gotta that's right it's right in that right in that gap <laughs> Okay, that makes sense. Well, look, I knew you wouldn't have tried this out. I wanted to talk about it briefly because I think it is going under the radar. Unfortunately, you know, people think about visual novels. They want to get them on sale, and I understand that completely. This is actually a full price title. This is a full 60, and I think that's probably going to have a little trouble in terms of sales in the United States in particular. But in this particular case, you can tell just from playing it, this is the director of the 999 series, the Zero Escape series, actually getting a budget. You have 3D environments, you have 3D characters, you have a higher coloration, uh, and just, just more budget in the actual game making. And so that's nice to see. Uh, but it wouldn't surprise me if they they look back at this release and say, well, it didn't quite make as much money as we would have hoped. Uh, but I love it. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, that's what matters to me. And if I can tell people that it exists, uh, that's worth it uh, from my perspective. Uh, the other listing I have here is Smorgasbord. Um, I know you mentioned Planetfall. I know it's been two months. And then I want to talk a few uh, things about the news items that have come out in the last couple months. Uh, but is there any other game that has really impressed itself upon you since we last talked on Two Hogs Are Better Than One that you want to make sure that you you say a few things about here uh, on this episode? There's probably a few. Um, I, sure, hit us. The most important one I, we already said, which is Plantfall, which I've just adored. Uh, I think it's a great 4X title. I think it's a great Age of Wonders title. I have played it for like 50 plus hours, it looks like. I am, I don't know, not even halfway through the campaigns. Yeah. And I'm just loving it. I think it's great. I really enjoy it. And if you're not familiar with Age of Wonders, it's a 4X series on the PC that is highly, highly focused on battle and tactics. Yeah, there's like a very sort of smallish economic component um, where you're sort of, you know, civilization style building cities and stuff and where you build them uh, is going to affect resources to an extent, but not, it's all mostly to the service of how do I get the most powerful units out onto the board uh, because I'm going to be at war with someone. Now, I've loved Age of Wonders for a long time. The series has bounced off you a little bit. What what didn't Planetfall has made the difference for you? To be fair, I don't, I don't know why 3 bounced off me so hard. I loved the Age of Wonders series initially, and my, my love kind of goes back to the original Master of Magic, which Age of Wonders is sort of a spiritual successor to, um, in that it's a civilization-style 4X game that features magic. Age of Wonders 3, I don't know if it just felt too fiddly. There's just too many things to keep track of. Oh, this guy's resistant to this kind of stuff and does this. Like, there's ways, there's so many abilities and resistances and weaknesses and damage types and stuff to keep track of. And I think actually Planetfall might have suffered from that for me as well had I not played Age of Wonders 3 kind of leading up to it um, and, 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 you know, sort of pushed myself a little bit past that learning curve to be like, all right, I'm a smart guy. I, I can I can do this. I can figure this out. I can understand this. And and really engage with it, which I have. And it's like, this is great. Like this, this is super great. And I think also I think Plantfall does a little bit on the, I don't know, sort of more campaign level or um uh, that's not right. Strategic level. Uh to make things a little bit more manageable, in my opinion. Streamlined, yeah. I think so. Uh I think the sector system that they end up introducing works really well. Um, ultimately it just means that, you know, instead of like in age of wonders three, basically literally every hex can technically host a city, uh, and you have to figure out where to put them there. Each sector can potentially be a city and your cities can't be closer than a certain amount, um, can't have be on, on adjacent sectors. And so that makes for a much simpler, like, okay, I'm going to put a city there. I'm going to put a city there. I'm going to put a city there. Uh, yeah, and, an homage to Endless Legend, I think. I think that was the first time I saw that kind of concept in play. Yeah, and I think that works really well. Actually, I think there's, I think Planetfall has, um, you know, interesting learnings from a, a couple different things. I think there's there's actually some Beyond Earth in there. 
uh endless legend uh alpha centauri like i think there's they're taking a lot of like for future forex like how does that work what can we do there and you, you said alpha centauri that means i can put a picture of mwabuda k morgan on this card i think oh, oh and the, um, <laughs> on the actual title card for the, the video it's done deal now man <laughs> Uh, how many people could reference Mwabuda K. Morgan? Uh, uh, it's me and some of my buddies in college, I think. There you go. There you go. Uh, but yeah, Planetfall is great, and uh, I highly recommend checking it out. Obviously, my brothers really loved it. I've loved Age of Wonders for a long time. Um, it's been a heck of a year for strategy. Uh, you got a new Anno game, which is one of my favorite series, and you got a new Age of Wonders game, which is one of my favorite series, both of which turned out great, which I always like to say. It's always touch and go sometimes. Sometimes they don't turn out great, but yep. these both turned out great. Um, what else did you want to hit on the smorgasbord? A couple other things. Um, uh, so there's a game called Children of Morta. Uh, which okay, I actually got, about got really into. It's, I guess it, it looks like I've only played it for six hours according to Steam, but uh, when I bought it, I played it a bunch. Uh, it is a sort of roguelike with a bunch of different characters, and the narrative is actually that all these characters are related. They're in a family of kind of adventurers that protect the world from darkness, and uh, each of them has their own you know, uh, play style and growth and things like that, and actually there's a, a nice system of as you level up a certain character, they gain access to passives that are shared with the family. So you have this in, in, intentional push to kind of level everybody up. And okay. so that constantly like rogue legacy kind of kind of has you um, continually uh, change. They have a lot of systems to basically make you play as different heroes. They also have a system of if you play someone too much, they get exhausted and then they're basically not as effective. They have lower health and lower strength and things like that. So they really want you to be rotating between the different people. Okay. And that creates a, a you know, a nice, uh, I think it helps fight some of the roguelike problems of like feeling like you're doing the same thing constantly because like one of the characters can play vastly different from some another one, but still within the same framework. Um, also, the narrative just talks about them in terms of their relationships. Like one of the the uncle character is divorced and is kind of dealing with, you know, how he feels about that, because I think actually it turns out that like he really loved this person um, and but something drove a wedge between them. I actually know what that is, but I just realized I shouldn't talk about it because this is kind of the interesting, <laughs> the interesting stuff. Um, but as you do that, like you're, you're kind of unlocking heroes as these um, family relationships are developed and you learn more and more and you have little, um, I don't know, slices of their stories with like the young kid that really wants to be an adventurer, but everyone feels like he's not ready and things like that. And it, it works out really well. Um, and it, I think it's it was it was really high on the steam lists for a while. And um, I don't and I think did really well. And I think it's coming to the consoles uh, looks like in a few weeks. Um, so I, I, I appreciate all of the kind of background and I like those kind of the context of what you're playing. What what are you playing? Is this a 2D action game? Is this a 3D puzzle? What, what is the game? It's a roguelike. So it's a top down kind of twin. It's like a dungeon crawler. Um, oh, you mean it's literally a roguelike. Yeah, sorry. I guess I, <laughs> as opposed to something with roguelike elements, this is literally okay. going through a dungeon that's sort of randomly Ooh. generated. And it'll it'll generate you know a few floors of that, and then you get a boss, um, and you're constantly earning experience as you go through it, and uh, you're gonna lose, you're gonna die, and you're gonna go back and get stronger, and you're gonna keep doing that until you eventually get past the next thing, and and so on. All and right, so I appreciate that clarity because I, I was like, okay, sounds interesting. What but what are we doing? And it okay, ends so up it's being, an actual rogue game, right? And well, and it ends it, it's it ends up actually being it's, that's pro, that's not fair because when I think of rogue like what I really think of is those ones where it's like I move and then the enemies move. Um, like uh, Chocobo's Mysterious Dungeon and such. And it's not that. It is um, it is a twin stick shooter, effectively. It's an action roguelike uh, okay. where some of the characters are m more melee, so they're not really twin sticking, but all the I'm same I'm going to have concept. to check that one out. That one sounds really interesting to me. You said it's coming to consoles? Yes, including the Switch. Um, so, you, and it's, you speak my language. No, I know. And it's it's 2D. <laughs> it's, um, it's pixel art. So it's probably a really good fit for the Switch, actually. Okay. All right. And you said you had a couple things. What's your last thing in the smorgasbord? That's a good question. Oh, so I'm just going to bring up one other one that's just kind of silly. It's in very early access on Epic. It's called Atomic Crops. Atomic Crops. Yes. So imagine okay. if you took 
some you made some sort of unholy union between Stardew Valley and a twin stick shooter. I got to be honest with you, Tom. I'm not. I'm going to level with you. I'm having trouble. You can't. You just can't put your head around that, and that's fair. You're, ju- that's you're just fair. a character in Stardew Valley, and you have weapons. Yeah. So you're you're. The idea is in your in the apocalypse. You're, it's after a nuclear apocalypse, and you're trying to build a farm. And why not? And sure, sure. And you use the farm. The farm ultimately is how you generate resources, money. Um, okay. It takes so just like Stardew Valley, each day has kind of a timeline, and you 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 have you have only a limited amount of time. Um, at the end of each day, you have to kind of defend your farm against uh, a horde of enemies. And then you go to the next day. And each day starts with you going to like a town center where you can spend resources on seeds and equipment and other things. And then um, each season is, I think, three days. And at the end of each season, there's a boss fight. And then you get like rewards based on how much food you provided. And so, so and you're balancing like literal stardew valley kind of farming stuff where it's like oh my plants need to be watered but at the same time i got to go out into the wilderness to find equipment or um seeds so that i can grow other plants and things like that so it's you know you've got this home base but you have to actually like leave it to go get stuff and then come back to make sure your stuff's getting watered and plant new things and and sow new ground and things like it's real weird but uh really fun and it's it's like i said it's in very early access i have no idea when this thing is due to be released um and i think is still pretty uh pretty early on but um yeah has a lot of interesting bits to it it sounds interesting i i i'm i'm grappling with what the game type is but uh uh, I will certainly give it a look. See, I think out of those that you just mentioned, what is it? Children of Morta is what children you of it? children of Morta is the name of the the family driven twin stick thing. Um, okay, that's the one that I think it sounds most interesting to me off the top. Yeah, no, that's fair. That's fair. Uh, Anything else? There's probably more. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm sort of looking at primarily. I'm in Epic, and um, uh, Steam. For the most part, uh, but I did just set up Game Pass, um, so I'm starting to kind of get stuff in there. Uh, I tried the beginning of Gears of Gears Five, but I don't. I'm not in any place to comment on it other than I played enough to be like, "Yep, that's Gears." Uh, I, I like Game Pass. Along with the next thing we're going to talk about in in the news section, I think it is very helpful to making sure that you always constantly have a backlog, um, and you feel bad about not playing more games. <laughs> uh, so Game I think Game Pass is a good value, uh, but. Uh, yeah, there's, there's way too much to play, and we, we are adults. We got work to do, uh, and it's it's a great time to be alive, but my goodness, you can't play everything, can you? No, you certainly can't. Like, it's impossible. Like, it's sort of, you know, the concept of I want to see every movie that comes out, and when you take into account all the indies and, and, and sort of random stuff, like, that's impossible. This is impossible times 10, um, <laughs> because just because the investment is so much higher. Um, yeah, it takes longer, absolutely. Like, saying you're going to watch every movie is at least I got to carve out, you know, a couple hours per thing. And now it's like, Oh, now I got to carve out, carve out like 20 to 40 hours per thing. Yeah. There's a reason I have a lot more postmortems about TV shows and movies. And I think control was the first one about a game is because it's there. there it takes a, takes a good chunk of time to beat any of them. Uh, so, um, but with all that being said, I did want to talk about a few things in the news uh, I know you said that you listen to virtual legality when you're driving around or you're running or you're doing uh, other stuff. So there are a couple of these things that I think that you are already at least aware of kind of uh, on a surface level, although you might not have gotten to that point in the virtual legality series. Sure. One of the things I wanted to talk about at the front end, which I, you're going to yell at me for because it's not on this, the, the list of things that I said we would talk about, is uh, this Apple Arcade. You know, I know. We obviously worked together on making some games in the mobile space, uh, which didn't work out because uh, they weren't free to play and everything was going free to play. And I think for a long time, the mobile developers and Apple and Google with their Android device have been trying to figure out this kind of fundamental disconnect that you can make a good quality product, you can put it on mobile, people are not willing to pay anything substantial for that product for the most part. And so I don't know if you're familiar with this, but Apple announced as part of their keynotes earlier this year that they were going to put together something called Apple Arcade, which uh, currently has a free trial, uh, but will ultimately be, I believe, $5 a month. And the basic idea behind this was 
For $5 a month, you're going to get access to this exclusive list of, at this point, it feels like a thousand games, but I think they've said a hundred plus games. Uh, and they are only going to be available through Apple Arcade for at least a period of time, much like Game Pass. Uh, and uh, you can download these and you can play them. And we promise that these are not going to have microtransactions. They're not going to have energy bars. They're all going to be okay for your kids to play. And they're going to be full, complete experiences, essentially in the box. Uh, and this thing came out, I, I want to say a week ago and because it's a free trial, I, I got it. I was interested in seeing how it worked and I have been absolutely floored by what Apple has put together behind the scenes on this. There's square games, there's Capcom games, there's excellent games from every corner of anything that you would want to play. Uh, and I have just been enjoying essentially every time I watch a football game or otherwise have a little bit of time on my phone, I just pick one out of the arcade, I download it and it's great. I don't know if you've gotten the chance to try it, but I want to talk to you a little bit about the economics here. You know, do you think this is a good solve? Do you think this is a way forward for the mobile space? And ultimately, after the trial, are people going to be willing to pay $5, which is roughly the same amount that they'll pay for Disney Plus for TV and movies and things like that? Are they going to be willing to pay $5 to essentially just have perennial access for what is, I think, in all likelihood going to be a rotating list of what amounts to excellent games on their mobile devices, iPads, and Apple TVs, as it turns out? What do you think, Tom? I have not had a chance to try it. Um, I'm not playing mobile that much, uh, typically. I uh, <laughs> I gave my son my iPad for his birthday. Um, nice. So I, don't, I no longer have an iPad. Well, he doesn't. He doesn't know. We uh, you know we rewrapped it and everything. Will be very <laughs> generous. Um, no, no, no. Oh, we already did this. I just meant that he doesn't know that we did. It oh. was just like here's an iPad. He's like woo. <laughs> sure. Well, e either way, it was generous whether you gave it up yourself or you paid new cash money. But uh, so I don't have an iPad, which is kind of my preferred. I want to. I think if I were to get one, um, I want to do a mini. I think like I, the smaller form factor really works for me. Okay. Um, but uh, that's my. I prefer the tab playing on the tablet to the phone. The phone's just too small and hurts my hands, and I, I don't really. Well, like taking it on faith that I'm right that these games are excellent. What do you think about the model? I. The first thing is I'm heartened that there's even explorations here, like with game pass. Um, it seems like everybody's doing something now uh, you play. I just saw has a, a subscription model. EA obviously has one. Um, so I, I think that's really fascinating. Uh, and I, I, I think it's a, an interesting direction. I don't know if the economics match up or not, to be honest. Um, yeah. I don't think Apple does necessarily, although they, they've obviously made their bet. I think that's uh, I think that's, well, and I think like, you know, it's a, it's, what does it cost to try this? And can we continue to? Uh, well, as it turns it out, probably pretty substantial. You can read some articles. If you follow virtual legality, you know that I really like Game Daily Biz for talking about business and legal issues around the game industry. They actually had a bit of a blowout on Apple Arcade. And as it turns out, Apple has actually been acting as publisher for, I think, almost all of these games and has been directly funding the development costs. Uh, which are recoup recouped, uh, slated to be recouped as a recoupable advance mm -hmm. against a, they don't, they haven't revealed the economics for how they're determining this. Earlier this year, it was suggested that it was going to be time played. Right. Uh, but a lot of people that comment on the industry don't like that metric because they think it encourages exploitative d game design yep. to get you to, to make sure you're engaged with the game. Yep. Uh, so they haven't said whether or not that's the way they're going to be calculating revenue. But it does look like Apple, and this might be a reason why they are so high quality and, and excellent at the front end here, especially, that Apple actually took a guiding hand, was helping developers both interact with the hardware as well as guide their development, and funding a lot of it at the same time providing the back-end support that a traditional publisher might. So Apple is pretty invested on all hands on this project. Well, that's cool. And like I said, I do think... And I mean, I think it's the same, you know, concept that Microsoft's going with Game Pass, which is like, we're going to acquire developers um, to, to, to build this thing. Uh, you know, it's, it's, you're getting into a weird situation where you talk about exclusivity being um, kind of non-consumer friendly. And this is going to be just push, pushing that even further. Because like, now well, it's their, like... Their exclusivity is odd, right? So I'll just give you a few examples. So... Uh, they're exclusive in the mobile space, definitely. Uh, but then there appears to be a, a kind of uh, gap between just the mobile space and elsewhere. There are a couple of games, for instance, 
that appear day and date in the Apple Arcade and on the Switch. Uh, one of them is, uh, or this might be on the PlayStation, so if I get the console wrong, uh, just yell at me in the comments, um, is a game called Sayonara Wild Hearts, which is an excellent, excellent game, uh, but it appeared in both places at once. But in the mobile space, you can't even play it. You can't buy it. Like, unlike Game Pass, you can't go around the horn on this. If mm-hmm. you want to play it mm-hmm. on your iPhone or your iPad, you have to be a member of Apple Arcade. So it's an interesting model, and you can actually see a list in the arcade of things that are actually labeled as exclusive to Apple Arcade. That's a much shorter list. It's like a dozen or something. And everything else is presumed to be either a timed exclusive or simultaneous in a, on another on another console. I think there are other games that are coming out on the Switch that are also in this arcade setup, as you would expect. You know, the sequel to... I think you're familiar with Oceanhorn, which was a very popular kind of Zelda alike on the mobile space. Mm-hmm. Oceanhorn 2 is exclusive to the Apple Arcade right now. And that's the kind of things that they funded and put in there. Um, but it's very interesting to me uh, whether or not that model is going to work because I think they are trying to they are trying to bridge that gap by essentially having it be low enough where maybe you just sign up and you don't think about it ever anymore. And if you can get to that level, essentially the hope is that the consumers feel like that is free. Let you have 30 games come into the thing on any given month, and that that all feels like a like a boon. Um, there are game the new Shantae is in there, which would obviously sell for five bucks or more. So it, if they get enough of those, it winds up feeling just kind of like a good idea if you play any of those games. But I know that you've been disappointed, uh, obviously with the the fact that we couldn't make the economics work at bite size with our games, despite some pretty good reviews. Uh, but just in general with the mobile space and seeing it become a slot machine gotcha creation thing. I, you say you're heartened that they're exploring this. Do you think this has any chance of succeeding? Yes, I do. Uh, All right. I, I, we got him on the record, folks. We got him. Yeah, he got me as, I think this has a chance. You're telling me there's a chance. <laughs> you're telling me there's a chance. Dumb and dumber references, folks. That's the kind of content you can get <coughs> on two uh, hugs or better than one. Yeah, so I, no, I think this is... I, everyone's been talking about the Netflix for games, right? Like that's, that's the next thing like streaming, basically not owning, just having access to libraries is the direction that everything seems to be heading. People are pretty into, they haven't figured out quite how to do it with, you know, like movies at a, at a premiere level, but they're thinking about it. This seems to be the direction, um, you know, people are interested in. Uh, And, yeah, I think it potentially can solve the problem that a, a premium app runs into when you've got so many free things sitting around. It's like, look, if I there's a certain psychological thing of just like if I commit that five dollars and then the game shows up, that game's free in my head. I'm gonna and, and I'm gonna go get my money out of this past, arcade. Past past Tom paid that five dollars, and now very generous present Tom may enjoy his the, may reap the rewards. <laughs> also, I, you know, the truth is like a $5 monthly subscription is so low uh, compared to just about anything. I have a gym membership. $50. Yeah, are you, it's like are you 50 bucks. It? I am actually. I'm trying to just start exercising. So that's good. Nice. But I mean, even hell. Okay. Let me let me make it one one bit funnier. I froze that gym membership because I wasn't using it, but I didn't want to repay the annual like sign up fee or whatever. Uh-huh. That is the, the frozen cost was still more expensive than this Apple Arcade. Well, you make a good point, and you, you, you talk about subscription services, and I think it leads directly into the next piece of news that I wanted to talk about, which is this kind of quasi-story right now, because everybody thinks it's kind of weird, and it'll probably be overturned, and what'll it mean, but I don't know if you saw, but the, the high court in France, presumably interpreting European Union intellectual property rules, but there's a little bit of discussion around that fact. Uh, has ordered Steam to allow resales of games that are purchased on Steam by virtue of the fact that a perpetual license is essentially a transfer of ownership and under what we would recognize in the United States as the first sale doctrine, meaning when you sell a book, that person can sell the book. They didn't get the copyright, but they can still sell the copy of the book they bought. Uh, And that should apply to things like digital games as well as digital goods. So things that pop out of loot boxes... Uh, and expansions and DLC and those kinds of things. You know, I talked at length about it in virtual legality, so people can check out that video directly. But there is a discussion about whether this is a good thing because it empowers people and it allows them to sell some of the things that they otherwise own and would, would sell if they could. 
or whether it's more likely to be a problem for the industry because the primary logic behind the decision was that because it's a perpetual license, because you don't charge for it on any kind of time basis, it can't be considered as anything other than sold. And one of the one of the fundamental kind of conclusions that I came to was, you know, the game companies want to do this anyway. It's easy enough to do. I think that if this were to hold in France and spread throughout the EU and potentially globally, the most likely thing that you would see is everything in games going to a subscription as a service type model that you would have things grafted on that require a dollar a quarter or whatever they could use that would work for consumers ends uh, if they otherwise would have to allow resale because that's going to be so problematic for them in terms of realizing their full profits. I'm not asking you to talk on the law here. I'm not asking you to talk on your interpretation of the EU's exhaustion principle. That's for virtual legality. (laughs) But sitting here right now as a person with a substantial Steam library, would you prefer to be able to have resale there? Are you okay with other people having resale there? Or do you think it's going to be a problem overall for the direction of the industry and what the industry is going to be able to sell to the consumer? Huh. Uh... (laughs) I can do a longer intro if you want. No, no. I mean, it's, (laughs) I think, I'm trying to think about this. Like, first of all, as a consumer and as a developer, like there may be some clash. Um, Yeah, that's true. Two hats. So it's, I'm trying to, see if those are actually separate, like almost try to figure out how I felt about used games when I was um, not a developer. Yeah. I mean, this is part and parcel to that conversation. One of the things that I said on, on my video actually was the other alternative is you might see some kind of version of the old game pass, not the Xbox version, but like the, the passes that came in uh, with discs that during the 360 PS3 era, you would have in your package so that you could prevent someone essentially from fully using their game if they sold it back to GameStop. Oh, right. If you're not familiar, you'd have these little cards. I remember that briefly. Yeah, you'd have these little cards, and they would say, yeah, you can play a bit of the game if you just have the disc that you purchased from GameStop, but you otherwise have to buy a $10 or $15 key from us, a one-use key, to get access to the full game. And that was designed by the publishers to try to get some of that profit back from the secondary market and could you see that in the digital space i think absolutely and i don't think people really like that it feels kind of shady because you are essentially transferring an executable or a disc in that case and not actually transferring the full rights to somebody to enjoy the game but i think that's the likely kind of solve for a publisher that wants to offer a single player perpetual license type game but also doesn't want to get burned on somebody selling it in the secondary market because they're forced to by a french court somewhere yeah this is loaded um i'm actually i'm really (laughs) having trouble sort of engaging with it and and understanding it um okay well we can send people to the virtual legality video and you can leave a comment there or we can otherwise save it for the next two hogs are better than one i didn't want to catch you flat-footed but this is in case you're not aware a conversation that's going on in various message boards and on social media as you might expect i will tell you to some extent i think this conversation is hypothetical i think that the french court in general reached a bit far in their interpretation of the exhaustion principle under eu law uh, and is likely to be overturned or at least to have their decision mitigated Uh, you know they tried to apply it to everything one of the things i said was you know if it does apply to digital goods virtual goods that come out of loot boxes Uh, essentially everything that the ESA and the various other parties that are in the video game industry right now are arguing against having loot boxes treated as gambling, that there isn't a secondary market, that you can't sell these things for cash money, that argument becomes much, 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 much harder to justify if essentially a court somewhere says you have to be able to sell these things, they have to have value because then you turn around, you talk to the regulator and you say, well, we say it doesn't have value. And they say, well, that that term in your contract doesn't count anymore. And so that's another kind of second order function of a decision like this. And I do think if this were to hold, it would be transformative for the game industry, regardless of whether or not you find that transformation a good thing. I think it would look markedly different than it does today. Yeah, I um. You know, as I sit here and think about it, I, I, I honestly don't think that the, the used game secondary market, I think it's generally bad for the industry um, because, I mean, obviously, like if the profits go down and, and I, in this case, I don't know who's getting the money effective. Like uh, in that in that case, it was GameStop saying, like, I'll buy your game for $20 and sell it to this guy for 50 
Yeah, it would be some secondary market runner, which you can, you know, the, the market would order itself, but would the publishers run that? Would Steam have a secondary market function? Would a new company come up and serve as that secondary market market auction house, essentially? It's on. It's all unclear. They would make a cut, and the players would make a cut that are selling their product. And so then, yeah, it's like, a, I don't know. Ultimately, I, I think, yeah, I think the market would just shift um, rather than have um, this secondary market that has to be kind of like, that's sort of unpredictable. You'd shift to yeah. like a, yeah, you'd either get like this subscription model or you might basically get kind of a rent to own kind of thing where it's like, look, you're paying a dollar a day. You can stop that whenever you want. When you get to 60 bucks, you own it. Um, and that may be the model, which is just to say, look, and, and maybe that's like, well, I mean, I guess the problem still exists there that once you own it, you could sell. Well, you might kick it down the road. I mean, it's an interesting option there. You You might have it where it's like, okay, if we can kick it, if we can kick ownership to five years from now, uh, have we realized all the profits we were likely to realize anyway? Um, right. If we can delay it so that you can't sell it until hell, probably a year or two is probably already you're pretty far down the tail. Yeah. Um, that maybe it's like the the impact on us is minimal. Yeah. Obviously, those budgets change for recurring revenue. That's essentially a drip feed, uh, and a whole bunch of second order functions kind of cr- go down from there. So I, I just think it's an interesting question. Uh, and obviously, you know, you, you do wear two hats. I think the, the argument that a secondary market works for the industry, and I think there's some evidence that bears this out, is that a GameStop helps to essentially keep churn that people are still engaged with the industry, much like engagement with an app, really, where even if you get 20 bucks back on your game, that 20 bucks is very likely to go to another game. And ultimately, the industry maybe doesn't make 100% of the profit, but it does make more profit than it would without that kind of grease function. Okay, so, you know, Steam, French law, as it turns out, you, Tom, don't have a lot of feelings on European Union, exhaustion principles, and intellectual property. Who can blame you? But it is a story that I recommend following because it will be interesting to see how it turns out. The next thing I want to talk to you about, I know you have an opinion on because you worked there. So let's talk a little bit about Spider-Man. As you probably know, and as I think you enjoyed last year, Insomniac Games made what I would argue is probably their best game. I know you haven't didn't have anything to do with that particular Insomniac game, so I apologize for yeah. even saying it. But I think Insomniac made their best game last year in Marvel's Spider-Man, and it worked out so well that notoriously independent Insomniac wound up being bought by Sony. Now, you worked there. You worked on Ratchet and Clank, A Crack in Time. You worked on what would be Fuse in pre-production, lest anybody hold it against you. <laughs> but what do you make of this news? You know Ted Price, the head of Insomniac personally, who has gone and interview after interview and talked about how important independence is to him. What happened here? And do you think it's a good idea? Do you think it's a bad idea? How do you feel about this? Um, I don't know. If, I don't know if I feel like it's a good or a bad idea. I know I'm not. I'm not knocking these out of the park here. Um, <laughs> you're an excellent interview subject this evening. I guess I'd say <laughs> I think it's overall a good idea. Uh, I yeah. mean, Insomniac was already pretty heavily in bed with Sony. Um, yeah. And I th- minus one Sunset Overdrive. Right. Yeah, well, and and I, I they were a second party that you know I think there was like a, we're going to make games for you Sony and Sony you're going to do things for us. Obviously, I wasn't signing any of those deals. I don't know exactly, but <laughs> you weren't. Um, I I think that that was the kind of case. Um, and I think w- from what I knew about even Ratchet and Clank and Insomniac's relationship with Sony, it was a very good one. Um, Sony was like, we're going to help you out. I think that the original kind of design for Ratchet and Clank wasn't very good, if I recall correctly. It wasn't it, it, it wasn't kind of hitting what they wanted? And Sony said, "We'll help you with we'll 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 publish this if you want, but maybe you want to rethink this." You mean way back in the PlayStation Two days? Yeah, I the, some of this is I, I think they've actually talked about this publicly, it's but I'm not, I'm not positive. Okay. But I do know the story behind sort of Ratchet and Clank and where it started and Sony's kind of hands in that. And um, I think that relationship's always been very good. So I think formalizing it seems like it doesn't, it, it's just a benefit. Um, it probably yeah. means that Sony has a little bit more that they are actually legally can do for Insomniac. Um, I think also it's just, be, I, I think being independent is getting harder and harder, frankly. Um, you know, the, the it, it, budget. It undoubtedly offers security. Budget, I mean, budgets it, are it, going up. Yeah. Uh, sales 
you know, requirements in turn are going up. Um, so, you know, I don't, but I don't, I don't know anything about Sony as a parent company. Um, I couldn't tell you exactly, you know, what they provide or, or, or how do I, I mean, obviously I think their, their purchase in general, you know, when a company purchases and kind of like, we like what you're doing, just keep doing it. Um, I think that's especially true with Insomniac and Sony because they've been involved for so long. You're just like, uh, Hey, would you like us to cover the costs for this stuff? Uh, yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask you this. When you worked there, were Sony people ever around? Were there meetings that they were involved in design at all with the stuff that you worked on? Not directly. Or, or is that above your pay yeah, grade? Yeah, it's probably or? above my pay grade. It's not directly anything that I worked on. Uh, Mark Cerny had an okay. office. I never saw him in it. But there was oh, yes, I, I visited you. I passed that There office. was an office in the building that said Mark Cerny. I, I might have taken a picture. I'll have to check my phone. Um, but uh, no, not not in anything directly that I worked on. Not you know, and um, okay, it wasn't. It, you know, Sony was very like you know we like what we, like I think they probably had like any publisher you know weigh ins. We we're like yeah we like the way this is going. You need to worry you know this is a problem. Um, but uh, and and they uh, I think they definitely offer they helped support us with certain resources. Well, I mean I think you know. The, certainly, I think Sony was interested. I think Sony's been interested in a while. I think Spider-Man was such a grand slam in terms of sales uh, for them that they felt that now was the time for the Sony side. Do you have any insight as to, is it just that things are getting more expensive or that they've been independent long enough and they want to not be anymore? Why now was the right time that you think speculating for Insomniac? Is it just the environment? Um, I think there's probably some of the, yeah, the the economy and the environment of, of games, the games industry, um, I think being like a large scale independent is hard. Um, so I think that's definitely part of it. Um, I think that for what it's worth, Insomniac, I think was held by very few people who are getting older and may have just been like, you know what? I love this game stuff that we've been doing. I'm going to keep doing it, but this is a good chance for me to kind of like have my exit plan. Um, of course, I, I, I th and get rid of some of the back end business stuff. Absolutely, I, I think that's definitely what was there in there, and that's not. I, there's no criticism there. Um, if, if it if it comes off as any, you know, in terms of like Ted Price saying at one point, like independence is so important, then turning around and doing this, like one, I think that's like, um, you know, time things change. Like, like you, yeah, if, I don't. If, think... if you quote someone 15 years ago and they do something different now, it's kind of like, well, yeah, but. I think you could do that to anybody. Um, no, and I don't think his quotes are terribly contemporaneous to this to the story. I just he has been out there with that, uh, and I don't think, God, I, you know, if somebody were listening to this, I don't think you sound negative at all. And certainly, my bread and butter, I help people sell companies, uh, and so I sell a lot of companies of founders, you know, people that put their blood, sweat, and tears into this thing. And yeah, at some point, you want to realize your gains, right? <laughs> right. You you want to you want to cash out to some extent. Um, and do something different with your life. And, and those can be serious conversations. But undoubtedly, I think that Spider-Man Spider -Man was the impetus because it was such a smooth kind of uh, joint involvement from multiple parties, including Marvel as part of that conversation, uh, that I think, I think it was just felt to be the right time. And Sony, I, I get the impression from various news sources over the last decade or so that Sony's always been interested in making this, making this a, a, a marriage yeah. as it were. No, I think that's always, I think that's actually, I, 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 I agree with that. I don't think I have any more advanced knowledge than you, but I think it was just basically, you guys are turning out great stuff. Like anytime you want to sell, <laughs> we're, we're over here. Exactly. And Hey, we got a, we got a bucket of money if you ever want. And I think this was an extra <laughs> thing of like, Hey, you just took this property that we, it's like one of our most valuable and made this huge thing that was wildly successful. Uh, That's right. here's a little, here's a little bonus on top of what we would have been saying that we would buy you for. Um, yeah. my one concern as I, we talk about this is actually the only thing is I love insomniac. I think they're innovators. I think they make great stuff. I think sunset overdrive was probably, uh, overlooked. Uh, yeah. In, in my opinion, like I've played, I've gone back and played it a couple times and been like, that's a really cool game. Um, Xboxians hate color, man. And I think, yeah, I think it was like Xbox was kind of like <laughs> not a great audience. Um, you know, I, think I love Xbox. I have an Xbox. I, I just, I, it, there's nothing color. They don't, 
colorful things on the Xbox seem to seem to go there to die. And I'm concerned that you know they're going to basically become Spider-Man Studios because certainly mm. there's enough work to do there, um, and some of that's going to die. Um, the the danger of all, uh, absolutely killing the project is uh, yep okay you you guys that that's what you do now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's like, and I can see that, and that's, I mean, that's, you know, Sony wants to, Sony wants to make their money on that, obviously. Um, it's uh, new, yeah, I think they're definitely new, doing Spider Man too. There's, there, there's no question. New IPs and innovation and all that's really expensive, and so uh, you know, my experience with these kind of things is generally it's, uh, they, they, we want you to work on this IP. We don't really want you to generate new stuff. Um, right, because sometimes you get Ratchet and Clank, and sometimes you get Fuse. Again, no offense intended to anybody on this episode. <laughs> um, yeah, well, you can. E- Fuse was an EA Partners joint, as you're aware. So I, I am. I like joint, by the way. I like their spike. Lead. We can have a we can have a debate <laughs> as to whether it was Insomniac's fault or not. Um, well, I don't want to get you in trouble with any of your former employers. Oh no, but it yeah. is what it is. F- Fuse didn't work in the market. I don't think anybody would disagree with that statement. I don't think Insomniac would disagree with that statement. <laughs> but it was well, fortunately yeah. the exception not the rule absolutely and insomniac's a great company i've enjoyed a lot of their stuff as well and i was actually thinking this you know i was watching the uh trailer and some of the kind of discussion of footage about the last of us part two that came out this week and you know it looks it looks good um but it looks dour right <laughs> for the most part for the most part naughty dog has for the last three games last of us uncharted four and now last of us two has been kind of seeped in this somewhat nihilistic somber not post-apocalyptic in reality in in terms of uncharted but certainly in terms of last of us just kind of depressed state of games and it looks last of us part two looks exactly as great as you would expect naughty dog throwing kajillions of dollars at the project would and i'm sure it'll be a good game but i was watching this and i'm looking at it and going Uh, I really, I miss color. I miss excitement. And I was thinking about which, which companies had really delivered that to me. And one of the things that I really thought of was Marvel Spider-Man last year is colorful. It is comedic. It is also dramatic. It is exactly what I love about video games. It's why it was in my top five of last year, uh, which I did a video on, which you can see if you're interested, but I, I miss that. I'm I'm happy Insomniac's doing Spider-Man 2. I know that's not official, but they are. <laughs> um, and and I'm looking forward to them doing more stuff uh, in other areas as well. I'm personally in favor of them being bought by Sony because I think it will give them a little bit more exposure, a little bit more funding. And uh, as long as they keep on keeping on, and truthfully, Spider-Man is the best they've ever done. I think that they're in a great position to be uh, a force for color and adventure and fun when gaming needs it the most on all consoles that aren't named Nintendos. Yeah, I um I mean we can talk about this ad nauseum. Uh, I I That's what we're I've doing. Off- we're, in, we're we're deep into our number we're 2 deep here. into nausea. Um <laughs> I I've worried a lot about the sort of um you know high budgets and the um what do you want to call it the constricting of the game industry both in terms of game types, genres, visual styles. Like it seems like everything is kind of, we're getting small, we're getting less and less variety. Uh, and so I think, yeah, like Spider-Man stands out as having a, a visual style that's different. Um, and they could have gone with more of a, I don't know, sort of desaturated Captain America palette. And that would have been fine. People would have been like, yep, that's, you know, MCU stuff. Um, yep, Crystal Dynamics is rolling that out at your consoles next May. But they said, no, no, we want this to be, you know, much closer to Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse. Uh, we want it to be the comic book, not the MCU. And Well, I love it to death. It's a great game. And, um, and yeah, and I think that, you know, that novelty, that difference now is very important. And I, I honestly think that the, the industry, maybe this is, you know, I'm not, I'm not making these million dollar decisions or billion dollar decisions. And so I understand there's a lot at stake, but I think that it feels like so much of the industry is focused on so little of the audience, or at the very least there's huge underserved sections that we just ignore now. 
Yeah, that they're not trying to necessarily build the pie because they know the pie enjoys Gears of War 5, which is great, uh, and, and other kind of hallway shooters. And, and there, I have no doubt, really, that Call of Duty Modern Warfare will be number one when the final NPDs come out for 2019. And, you know, more power to them. Um, me personally, I can enjoy a Call of Duty game. I can enjoy Gears of War. I like a variety in my diet. Yeah. Uh, so at the same time, I like, I like Dragon Quest XI. I love Spider-Man. And I look at The Last of Us, and I do wonder, I sit back and go, have I already spent enough time slowly walking through the snow on a horse and or fighting a zombie horde in a post-apocalyptic environment? Right. Well, and I think Spider-Man last year in particular is the merger of the two. It's um, it's something different, but also at a AAA level. Um, and yeah. that just doesn't happen that much no and that's why they killed it and and you're right about underserved right i mean it sold 16 million copies and yeah it's hard to peel that away from spider-man it's it's freaking spider-man well, uh, i mean but, I, there's gotta know, be other spider-man like some of the other spider-man games yeah. were not great and i i think i was just gonna say that actually <laughs> at the end of the at the end of the kind of Beanox spider-man games uh you had essentially oversaturation of that particular brand and games that were okay-ish and to the extent that they sold it was because of spider-man and this one, while it wouldn't have sold as much, if you change that out for, you know, B-Man B or Arachnid Man or, or, or whatever, is still a good game at its baseline level. Um, and so I, I think that's one of the reasons that they worked out so well. Speaking of Spider-Man, and we can do this really quickly because I, I want to talk about what we're looking forward to and wrap this episode <laughs> up. Um, but speaking of Spider-Man. You're aiming for an hour, right? Yeah, we always aim for an hour. And then, you know, and then, we aim for an hour, we hit two, we do what we do. And then we spend uh, that hour yeah. on what stuff am I playing right now? <laughs> Leave your comments in the description if you're like, I don't know why I listen to these two idiots ramble for two hours. I should have listened to them ramble for one hour. That's fair. We will take your comments under advice. We can just do this and just split it. And we'll just do a, oh. another intro. Double the monetization. <laughs> YouTube loves us, Tom. Loves us. We'll do it. We'll do it. Uh, the whole the, episode in 10 minute increments. You know, there are people that do that, in all honesty. They take what is like a, obviously a single kind of concept, maybe even taped all at once, and make it into a series that just kind of cuts to black and then like starts right back up on the next one at like 10.07 <laughs> and then 10.03. Um, we're not about that here. We are here for your value here on the Hoglaw YouTube channel. We appreciate the 33 cents that this six hours of work will net us from YouTube and our Google overlords. So thank you very much for watching and listening. <laughs> but before we get that 33 cents, we actually have to finish the discussion. So I was going to ask you just really quickly, the news of the week, multifaceted, Spider-Man's coming back to the MCU, which if you follow virtual legality, you know was my prediction from the off of this whole thing over the summer. And also, Companies like money. Kevin, Kevin Feige is joining Team Star Wars to make a new Star Wars movie with an announcement that sounds suspiciously like he will have total creative control while Kathleen Kennedy remains president of Lucasfilm unsurprisingly the multi-billion dollar profiteer kevin feige is going to be given fairly close to carte blanche to actually go and we won't use the word save the star wars brand we will say aid <laughs> what is definitely not a teetering on the edge of disaster star wars brand and everything is perfectly fine they're just adding feige to the the cooks in the kitchen because as we all know you can never have too many do you have any thoughts on these pieces of news, Tom? I think it's been a good week for all this stuff. But if you have a different opinion, let me know. Um, I didn't follow these too closely. I knew that they happened. Uh, the Spider-Man one doesn't super surprise me. Um, but I and the funny thing is, is I, I listened to your your discussion of this and basically agreed with it, which is like, yeah, they're just negotiating. Like, yep, this is sort of like, I think uh, I don't remember what it was. And eventually, this this is not true now. But I think I think it was Scrubs would leave Netflix like every year or was like effectively going to leave Netflix every year. And then it would get saved you, like right at the end. You did see a bunch of Netflix shows that would put up their little, their little box that says leaving October 3rd or, or what have you. And then they just wouldn't. <laughs> and you'd be like, well, I guess they signed up a new license. Yeah. So this one didn't, didn't surprise me. And I think as you, you pointed out in one of your analysis, it's like there's, they didn't have to solve this for quite a while. So 
uh, there was no real impetus to do it. I'm glad that they did. Um, I think that'll pave a, a cleaner road. But Well, the big news to me was actually that the windows were the same, right? One of the things I said was that the window was now, while they were essentially fighting, and immediately before they wanted to start production on the next Spider-Man, because that's a, essentially the point of no return, right? You lock in whether Spider-Man's going to continue with MCU background or not. Um, but as it turns out, the announcement from yesterday was that they are going to release Spider-Man Home 3, whatever it winds up being called. I still like Broken Home. <laughs> uh, on... Uh, on July, I think it is, of 2021. So two years from now. So if you're doing your math, you realize, oh, uh, that script is is done-ish. Uh, they're ready to go into pre-production and production. Those windows are the same. Uh, if, if, they're, if they were going to settle it, they're going to settle it now. And they did. Uh, and so, yeah, I gave two windows. I didn't realize they overlapped because I didn't realize they were that far down the road of essentially planning out what Spider-Man 3 was going to mm-hmm. be. Um, so yeah, I think it's great news. I think honestly, if you watch far from home, you can, again, we, I did a postmortem on that movie cause I just saw it on digital last week. Mm-hmm. But, um, if you watch far from home, you look at that and you realize just how difficult it was going to be to, to unwind the current Peter Parker's backstory from Tony Stark and the Marvel cinematic universe. Like what would that even have looked oh, like? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, so are you like not I, allowed I to refer to Tony Stark at that point? You're like probably. I mean, <laughs> it, it, it's always a matter of what's in the contracts, but you certainly can't use him going forward. And probably his actual backstory is in question. Like, how much can you reference the blip? <laughs> how much can you reference, you know, what the state of his universe is? It all starts uh, and with, that, with Tom Holland waking up in bed. Yeah. Well, it would have been an open question. And I'll tell you this. One of the rules of intellectual property law is don't go into a lawsuit against Disney. (laughs) They have more money than you. I don't care whether you're Sony. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So I think this was great news for everybody. Obviously, I love the MCU. But I did think Endgame was an okay jumping off point. I might wind up jumping off the MCU there. The, The more interesting news to me was the savior, the architect of the MCU, coming in and saying, yes, I would like to do some Star Wars. <laughs> what do you think of that? Uh, I think, I mean, uh, without trying to piss too many, many people off, he certainly can't make it worse. Um, ooh, ooh, shots fired. Leave your comments for Thomas Hoag. Uh, direct them in to him, please, by name, in the comments to this video. <laughs> yeah, uh, there are people that like Star Wars, especially that there are people that like Star Wars Less Jedi. The only problem with that sentence is I have never met them. Okay, so wait. We are people, I am people, who like Star yeah. Wars. If I could, yes. like, Eternal Sunshine, Last Jedi, sequel trilogy. from my brain, okay. uh, I think that would be fine. I think that would be, I'd be a yeah. better, I'd be a happier person. Um, mm-hmm. Because I think The Last Jedi, and we don't I want to get into a Last Jedi thing, but... The problem with Last Jedi no, is not no. just this that is, it, this is not contentious at all on the internet. Don't worry that, about it. Your opinions are safe. That here. as a film, it's not particularly good, or as a Star Wars film, it's not particularly good. It's that it undermines everything that came before it. Um, yeah. In the character, we've talked the about that heroism. Yeah, yeah, and that's a problem. That's like, that's the big. That's the big issue there. Um, so no, I think this, I think this is great. I think, um, I'm actually interested with given, you know, Feige's work on the MCU, if we end up getting those sort of side Star Wars stories that was kind of theoretically discussed, like you got a little bit in Solo and Rogue One, but like really trying to be like, we're going to build out the universe, not just talk about Jedi, um, and, and, and then bring that together in interesting ways. Yeah, I think so too. As a matter of fact, I think, You know, if there was any problem with the uh, Star Wars story approach, which I think was a great kind of starting point idea, was that they just wound up going back in the past and kind of prequelizing those things and saying, okay, here's how you found the Death Star plans. Here's what Han Solo was like. And it should have been, here is a bounty hunter at a cantina in a planet we've never seen dealing with a film noir mystery. And that's his story. And then he shows up in this other Star Wars story. And that Star Wars story is, in fact, something about a noble on a different planet and dealing with political intrigue and whether or not he's going to be made senator and a coup attempt on the kingship of that planet. 
Uh, but that bounty hunter is part of that, and then they and they and then there's a Jedi story about somebody that's an apprentice at, at the academy or what have you, and then they come together as an intergalactic threat happens. What, whatever it is, I'm sure. Not, hey, I don't get paid for this. All right, <laughs> thank you, Kevin. Get in there. But yeah, I think uh, but, the idea uh, that the, the success of the MCU, right, partially is because, and it, it's it, I feel like uh, this is where television actually ultimately has the advantage over movies, is they got to yeah. build these characters for so much longer. And then create interesting intersections yeah. that were, you know, cool movie moments. And it's like, we don't have to spend so much time teaching you who these people are. We've already done that. Yeah. And that's why Infinity War is technically my favorite movie in the MCU. But if I'm talking to somebody about it, I say it's Black Panther because I love Black Panther. But that one, you, you can understand Black Panther start to finish. You, you, you go into Infinity War and, you know. Just suddenly Chris Pratt from Parks and Rec shows up in a spaceship singing 70s tunes. And you're like, OK. <laughs> yeah, it's and I mean, it's like on the one hand, I guess, to to an extent. Yeah, it's, it damages them as sort of individual movies because it's this loses resonance if I haven't seen the thing that preceded it. Um, and it gains so much from being that like so much time has to be like movies. Ultimately that, that two to three hours that a movie gets is not a lot of time to establish characters and arcs and plots and, and things like that. So that's right. Um, the MCU, you know, benefited from effectively like being a serial television show. And I would love to see star Wars. I love star Wars as a property, as a universe, not just as the one thread that we've really, you know, touched on. Like I've, you know, you have more exposure to the extended universe than I do because you've read the books and, and things like that. Right. But I think that what George Lucas created actually has a lot more depth and interesting space than what we've seen, than what we've touched yeah, on. Yeah, the Disney Star Wars seems locked on to this. Star Wars is about rebels versus empires with a, a, with a smattering, a sprinkling of lightsaber flourish. And to me, that's it's exactly right. That's never what it was about. And I think Kevin Feige, all of his interviews, even before the MCU really took off, talk about the fact that he's read all these expanded universe books, that he has the comics, that he has 150 characters from Star Wars, that he loves Star Wars so very, very much. Um, and just knowing what he has done with the MCU and basically kind of mining all these comics to come up with the strongest through line that he could. Um, look. Him doing Star Wars might mean it's a lark, might mean it's one movie that he just wants to play in the universe. <laughs> um, I, I suspect it is not that. And I suspect when you have a, a meeting with the two heads of Disney Studios and Kathleen Kennedy and Kevin Feige winds up with Star Wars, uh, that was not a request as much as it was uh, uh, people telling what was going to happen. Um, and I think the only real risk is that Disney can't afford to have Kevin Feige's Golden Goose at the MCU die. And so if it proves to be weaker because he's being pulled in too many different directions, I think he has to go to the Marvel Universe first. Um, outside of that, I really think this could be a smashing success, and I will be fully honest with you. It is as, as positive as I have felt about the Star Wars universe since December of 2017. <laughs> Speaking of Star Wars, for our final segment, we always talk about what we're looking forward to. Obviously, Rise of the Skywalker in December is going to be interesting. There are some leaks out there. I haven't read them. Uh, there are some notions about what is going to happen. I think J.J. is very likely to riff on Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. If you are familiar with Star Trek Into Darkness, which I hate with a lot of passion, um, you'll note that J.J. essentially reversed various aspects of The Wrath of Khan as a kind of clever homage uh, in his parlance. And I would suspect certain reversals and, and similar kind of treatment of this final movie. I have no doubt that it will be well-directed. I have no doubt that he will get better performances out of uh, most of the new actors than Ryan Johnson did in most cases. Um, and it will be a fun lark. I suspect it will be like a, like a typical kind of sci-fi big blockbuster movie. I don't expect it to be terribly satisfying as an end of a trilogy because I don't think these movies really gel together. So we're really hoping to get a, a movie that is uh, decent on its own and kind of forget all this end of the Skywalker saga finale of the sequel trilogy. I, I My hope is that it's entertaining is really all I can hope for. Is there any other thoughts you have on Rise of Skywalker? No, that's mostly it. I mean, <laughs> I'm going to add all these contentious things. So basically, your audience hates me. 
Uh, yeah, okay. Again, comments, just Thomas Holden, yeah, put at, colon. At, at yeah, Tom. At, exactly. Um, you asked me at one point if I thought there was anything they could do with Rise of Skywalker to sort of save this, this, and I don't, I don't think so. And then you cackled like Palpatine and JJ overheard you and there it was. <laughs> I was like, I don't, I don't honestly think so. I think that, um, yeah, I think the best they can do is make a good movie. Um, I think, yeah, this doesn't work as a trilogy at all. Um, it just doesn't, uh, it's not really internally consistent. It's, you know, there couldn't be more different stuff between, I think like set, uh, force awakens and, and last Jedi. Uh, not at all helped by the fact that they take place within 24 hours of each other. I just think it's like, it's, it's really, yeah, they're really weirdly different. Um, sure. And they, but you're going to go see rise, right? Probably. I mean, admittedly, yeah, we're we'll talking to the person who I believe our last podcast was about how I didn't have time to see end game. Um, oh yeah. And yeah I was, right. I don't know, a hundred times more excited for that. Um, yeah, you just couldn't make it out there. Yeah. So now if you yeah. add that, it's like, uh, it could happen, but I will not hold my breath. Well, the second part of the star Wars coin is that in November respawn entertainment famous primarily for Titanfall, although I'd have to, I'd have to ask somebody whether they're more famous now for apex legends or not, <laughs> um, is releasing a single player non microtransactions. He is very clear about this because they still feel burned from 2016 and 17. Still I think. Apologize. Uh, that, yeah, exactly. That no gambling elements included star Wars game, really the first kind of single player narrative star Wars game that EA has released in its 10 year contract with Disney. Um, uh, the trailer for that game came out on Thursday. I checked it out before I give my two cents, because I tend to be fairly domineering about these ah. things. What do you think about the trailer for this game? Okay. So first I have to just put in a stupid thing that I cannot get past. I okay. am watching shameless and I yep. cannot see that actor as not, uh, what Ian Gallagher. Okay. Well, so let's take a step back from there. You know, how do you overall feel about actors being video game characters? Cause I don't love it. Yeah. I, I, I don't love using the likeness either. I don't think it gets you very much. Like, like he can do, he could do the performance. He could be the voice actor. I can kind of notice that. I find the likeness more jarring than anything. Um, yeah. Because, and I think that's like extra uncanny Valley. Like it's not just uncanny Valley is like, okay, that, that doesn't move like a human does. This is like, that is a human I've watched perform. And he does not. Well, did you do see, <laughs> did you see the death stranding trailer or briefing that they released at uh, TGS? No. So Death Stranding has the same issue, right? Because its main character is, I'm going to get this wrong. The walking Norman Dead guy. Reedus. Nor Thank you, Tom. And it's straight up an actor. This is not unexpected because Hideo Kojima has basically always wanted to be a movie director. <laughs> um, and so we moved from just having Keith or Sutherland voice uh, in, in Metal Gear Solid 5 to, hey, let's pay for some actors. And I looked at that and I'd have, I'm not really... I haven't watched The Walking Dead in years and years and years. And I only watched a couple episodes. Norman Reedus in Death Stranding. And I think it's going to be a great game. I love Hideo Kojima. It's off-putting. Because you're like, I know how your face moves. And it's not that. <laughs> so, I mean, I feel the same way. And so outside of that, let's put that in a bucket and say, we don't love actors necessarily having their likenesses in the video games. What did you think of this trailer? Um... So I just watched it before we did this while you were kind of like putting the notes together. That's and right. And I didn't feel much of anything, um, to be honest. Like, okay. yeah. I... Did you feel it was evocative of Star Wars? Did I feel it was evocative of Star Wars? Yeah, I mean, it obviously has the music. It's It's got lightsabers buzzing. I mean, it's trying to get you to feel Star Wars. What did, did, you, did you have any of that Star Wars vibe? A little, I guess. A little. Yeah, I think I'd probably say a little. I can't be I can't be totally say there isn't anything. I think uh, one of the people turns on a red lightsaber. That felt pretty Star Wars. <laughs> um, but uh, no, I mean red bad. <laughs> one, one of one of the things. Yes, it's very Pavlovian. Uh, one of those things that I my comment was is like I should really really be excited about this. And I know the E3 demo wasn't great. Like it didn't knock anybody's socks off. It didn't knock my socks off certainly. 
Um, but I watched this, and I, I it was after Kevin Feige Day, so I'm in, I'm in good spirits, and I watch this trailer, and I look at it, and I say, um. It doesn't feel like Star Wars to me. You've got a big bat person. You've got weird people in suits. You've got a... I don't know who these people are with the red lightsabers. And the primary issue for me... And we just talked about how much I love color and adventure in Spider-Man and Insomniac. As I, and I think I tweeted this out. I said, didn't Star Wars used to have color? It's all this desaturated Xbox 360-esque grittiness... And I hate it, Tom. <laughs> I I hate the art direction on this game. I will buy this game. I It's under the category here. What are you looking forward to? I am looking forward to playing this game because I love Star Wars. I'm very hopeful. You know, it's got, I think, the director from God of War 3. Uh, it's a new single-player respawn team. It's got Electronic Arts money behind it. But I watch that trailer and go... I almost wish this wasn't a Star Wars game because if this was just Lords of Shadow 3 or something, I could get behind it. Uh, right this second, it doesn't look or feel anything like Star Wars to me. And at the same time, that same day, Vader Unleashed Part 2 on my Oculus Quest came out and that felt like Star Wars, man. <laughs> I I love that thing so much. I don't know if you've played Jedi Training or the, the Lightsaber Dojo or whatever it is, but man... Oculus Quest, Vader Unleashed, 100% recommended. I, what did you feel about the art direction, the coloration of this? Obviously, it's all just a two-minute trailer. We're just speculating and guessing on it. And then we'll do our final what are you looking forward to so people that are listening to this can say, when are these people going to be done? Uh, but what did you think about the art direction? Yeah, I'd say it, it, it seemed a little desaturated, but it didn't, like, super bother me. Um, okay. I think, like, I guess the, the weird thing that I couldn't, you know, this struck me is... I don't know much about where this game is taking place or anything like that. And right after, hold on, hold right after the yeah. point I was going to make is I don't think anything that they've put out really demonstrates that. Um, okay. and, and I think that's a problem. Like I can't see, I don't even know. Are, am I in, where am I? I think this is post order 66 effectively. Yep. yep. Um, but I just don't think like, I haven't seen anything that's like, oh, I can see, I don't know, Trade Federation droids to kind of draw me into, or clone troopers or something that's like, okay, I get kind of where I am. Um, there's just, and and I know this this sounds sort of, uh, I don't know, orthogonal to the, the concept of, well, I want them to do more Star Wars stories that are away from the main thread. And, and I do, and I think this is a good opportunity for that, but I think you still need a, at least like a temporal jumping off point of like, where am I? What are the powers in the universe? Um <laughs> And I I haven't felt that. You wanted you wanted one trailer to just start with six years after the Emperor decimated the Jedi, one man tries to find peace of his I own. I mean, ideally in less of a movie trailer voice way and more of a organic way. That's like I miss trailer voice. That's guy. like, oh, okay, I see who you are, I see why this is the situation you're in and why that's important. Um I I all the stuff I've watched I haven't gotten that. Like, yeah, we're on some factory planet to get in some MacGuffin and I actually think that's very evocative of what rise of Skywalker is likely to be. So, you know, MacGuffin's a whole, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's a, yeah, it's, it's sometime between three and four. Uh, I, my joke was that, you know, between rebels and uh fallen order and all this other stuff, there are so many Jedi running around under Vader and the Pal and, and Palpatine's nose. <laughs> uh, there's just Disney just keeps adding Jedi. Well, <laughs> stop turning your lightsaber on. Admittedly, dude. I think it's hard to exterminate an entire class of people in the galaxy. Yeah, I guess. I mean, I was told that it happened. <laughs> By the time four comes around, I'm supposed to be the last Jedi. And then when the last Jedi comes around, he says he's not the last Jedi. I mean, make up your mind, Luke. <laughs> anyway. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, look, I'm going to play it. I am hopeful that it is fun. Um, I'm not expecting too much from it. Uh, but... That trailer did uh, basically nothing for me. And what it did do, which is like, ooh, cool big bosses, I look at it and it's like, well, those none of that feels Star Warsy to me, which is entirely separate from how I felt playing like The Force Unleashed, which is a very, very similar concept. Yeah. You know, I, it, when I was watching the trailer, I was thinking about how I used to love like the Jedi Academy game and stuff. Yeah. And I was like, and I know like that those had issues. 
And those were not great mm-hmm. in a lot of regards. But like, I played Jedi Academy like three times with like three different character builds and stuff because like I just liked being in that world and flying around and deflecting blast bolts and all that jazz. For the record, Jedi Outcast made available on your Switch last. There week. you go. Five bucks. Um. So yeah, I, I will play it. I'm fairly certain my premier EA access doesn't end until sometime next year. Thanks to Anthem. Thank you. Anthem from my brother. Uh, yeah, pretty much. I've, I've actually gotten some use out of that. You know, that was not, a, not expected. Um, you know, playing the new plants versus zombies. Love that. Um, I got to try chaos Bane, which I didn't really care for. Um, yeah. I love plants versus zombies. That'll, that'll be on the next stab toe, I think. Cause it's not officially out till next month. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, so that's star Wars corner. Anything else you're looking forward to? I'm mainly focused on star Wars through the end of the year here. Nothing in particular. I mean, like as is, as is typically our sort of discussion, I don't, I don't hype. I don't try to, I try to not, not I'm going to have to come up with a new ending segment because it's always Tom's like, "Eh." not establish expectations. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So we'll do what I always do, which is let's go look at what's on my wish list. There you go. You're going to look at what's coming out next. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, this this week alone, you got Ori on the Switch. You got Dragon Quest Eleven finally coming to the Switch with a 2D mode for us old fogies to feel like it's an old Dragon Quest. Uh, really enjoying that so far. Um, obviously, I love my Switch, and I'm playing those games. Game Pass continues to kind of churn out the stuff. I think The Outer Worlds comes out next month, Tom. I know that's one that you probably look oh, forward to. Oh, I'm definitely to. looking forward to The Outer Worlds. That's on Game Pass, right? It yeah. is on your Game Pass now, son. I so and I when I signed up for that, I was well, that was one of the ones I looked at and was like, "Yep, yep." I, am, I, <laughs> I want knew to you play would. that. Um, these are all out. So, so mostly we're involved in uh, looking at traveling to different planets and hitting things with swords or guns. Yeah, I think I, uh, that's that's the thab. Outer, hour. outer worlds, I'm definitely <laughs> looking to. Um, trying to think of what else. Uh, that's all right. Hey, man, if nothing pops up, you don't have to force it. I was just curious if there's anything on top of mind. Um, if, like I said, I am looking forward to Star Wars. You know, November is that kind of month. The new Pokemon comes out. Doom Eternal, you might be looking yeah, forward I might, to. Yeah, I'm interested to see what happens with the new Ghost Recon. Oh, yeah, Breakpoint. I will tell you what will happen. It will sell a kajillion copies, and no one will ever talk about it. <laughs> that is what will happen. All fair. It'll just inexplicably be third on the sold through at the end of the year. And everybody will be like, oh, yeah, that game came yeah, out. Who's, what's going on there? <laughs> but no, it should be pretty cool. I mean, it's essentially it's whatever the last Ghost Recon was called only now with robots. They're making a, the, a, it's a I'm looking at Epic. Um, they're they're releasing a new Mech Warrior, which I'm interested. Oh, right. In December. Yep, I December think. Uh, by Piranha. Okay. Um, Mech, Mech Warrior should be pretty cool. Again, ringing endorsement of the Epic Game Store from Tom. He he only plays Epic now. Ah, uh, that is sort of accurate. <laughs> it's not intentional. It's just like they keep buying the things that I want. They keep buying the games <laughs> I want. That, that, that's the plan. <laughs> that's what they're doing. Um, All right. Well, cool. Yeah, you got Mech Warrior. You got some Star Wars games. You got some other shooties. Um, and, uh, yeah, I know my girls are looking forward to Pokemon. My, my youngest daughter adores Pokemon right now. She can tell you every stat about all the Pokemon uh, and she hates it when I say Pokemon. <laughs> uh, she says, she says that's wrong. That's incorrect. Um, They're Poke people. Yeah. That's <laughs> how dare you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So no, she actually says they're Pokemons, but, sure. uh, you know, we can have that debate later. Um, but so that, that'll be fun. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think it'll be a fun kind of, uh, uh, end of the year. Uh, other than that, I think that's about it. Do you have any final thoughts before I sign off permanently here? Or, or at least, uh, per- I think until next is, month. Is there a dark I- ending here to this podcast? <laughs> dark, dark ending. No, it's when I, when I say signing off, I forever. Of Rip- I immediately think of Ripley at the end of Alien. Um, and, and her saying signing Not off, the- which even then wasn't permanent because Aliens 2. <laughs> Uh, or, or aliens, I think is just the name of that, uh, Jim, Jim Cameron. Um, but no, do you have any other thoughts? Uh, nope. I think that's it. I think that, that's pretty much covered. Awesome. It. Well, I mean, I know we didn't have this cadence down. It was two months. I think we talked about it before we started taping this episode. We want to try at minimum to hit once a month. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's, I think that's our, our goal. 
Um, and if we can do better, we will. Um, but I think once a month we can we can promise to find a time. Obviously, we're on two different coasts, uh, and we have to make sure that we can make it work for our families and our jobs and everything else. But I think we can make it work at least once a month. Uh, and for those of you that are fans of this show, A, we very much appreciate it. We know it's sporadic, and we know we have echoes and other technical difficulties, so we appreciate you hanging in with us. Uh, and if you do like this show, share it around. Uh, we're having these conversations. I'm, I'm fairly willing to bet that this might be the only internet-based podcast and YouTube video series featuring a AAA video game developer and a corporate mergers and acquisitions. Uh, this is like, if you put I, enough qualifications on something, it's the only one of it. <laughs> I don't think that was too much. I'm just saying, yes, if I were to also say that are related, I think, you know, you go bridge too far. But, I mean, I think corporate lawyer, some good economics, business, and law, some game development, inside the industry insights and the occasional answer where he just says uh i have no idea i think that's what you can get and we can promise on this show for the foreseeable future we're going to try to hit that monthly cadence otherwise if you watch this on youtube we really appreciate you watching thank you so much if you caught this in its podcast format thank you for making it the full two hours plus and, and getting here to the end we really appreciate you listening to it please if you get a chance review it on the service that you're listening to it on and we will try to catch you next month on the next episode of Two Hogs Are Better Than One. Thanks so much. Thanks, guys.